Yes. Sorry about that. Thank you. But I don't think Anthony, I mean, not Anthony. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. 2020? That's what I was saying. Yeah. What is it? Oh, no, I'm just, I'm already pregnant. You're welcome to have. Oh, that? Actually, I'll take that. Thank you. I'm going to push up front. No, it's all right. It's all right. Although I didn't know you were here, I was like, refreshing. I probably probably back. There's a little more space fully. Uh, everyone. I know. I know. Okay, then I'm giving up. Did you get oil personally? Maybe we're over capacity. Did you get oil? Okay. Does somebody need this seat? Because I will certainly. No. Uh, no, I'm not. That's what I said. There's a yellow piece of paper. I'm going to see. I found that one on a hotel. That worked for me. Thank you. 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 We don't. Okay. I want to print this out. Is it your pants doing a print this out? Thank you. Because I think it'll. Uh, there'll be a couple of people in the rain. Stick your feet. Send the draft version for some reason. I can't get in. Hello. Um, Hi, I wanted to send you a call, but when I get coffee, but only for any members. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, good evening. My name is Janine Kiley. Um, Anita Brandt. Welcome to the business session for Soho NoHo Working Group. And this is a working meeting. The public is welcome to listen, but not participate. And we have seven attendees, and we also have four, um, four community board members, Akila Asqui, Susan Wittenberg, Chris Dignis, and Dr. Shirley Smith, who are joining us hybridly. So thank you for joining us. Uh -huh. So, um, so we've, for the working group, we've shared a draft of, um, I want to thank everyone for uh, commenting on the draft, the, the uh, draft resolution that is in Google Documents. I know every single committee member or working group member has commented, so thank you. Um, why don't I turn it over to Anita and she will run the meeting. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think part of this uh, meeting is also to hear from other uh, board members. Um, I guess we have committee members. We don't have any uh, other uh, board members, but we would like to make sure that we hear everyone um, with regards to this uh, document and with regards to the direction we're taking. Um, I think... Uh, I did actually just write a new introduction because I thought we were getting a little dry. <laughs> so uh, as soon as uh, Janine takes a look at it, I wanted her to review it first. But um, why don't you just read it out loud? Because I well, it's ten parts. Oh, okay. Well then, <laughs> well, let's. Well, you can just read it. I mean, I think you're good. I think it should go on the documents and everybody yeah. can read it. We're having a Wi-Fi issues. Otherwise, we add it oh, to that. Have it here. Oh, fabulous. Sorry. And we do have a couple copies. Two copies. Yeah. Two copies. Um, do you want to read it? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, you, you, I know what it says. Okay. Um, where, this is the introduction. New York City's precious NoHo SoHo district, Bella will like that, is in an immediate and unprecedented danger. The city's Department of um, Planning is rushing to impose a rezoning of NoHo SoHo that will unleash a highly aggressive profit grab by some of the world's richest real estate corporations. In its wake, the SoHo NoHo neighborhood plan will eliminate valuable zoning constraints that made this historic district unique, attractive, and highly successful. At the heart of SoHo's success has been the adaptive reuse of historic cast iron architecture by pioneering artists and unique small retailers who together transformed a dying industrial district into a highly distinctive world-renowned neighborhood. We've been flooded with a professionally constructed disinformation campaign that dishonestly claims and then weaponizes our city's urgent goal of creating a new affordable housing. In reality, this plan would inevitably expel many current residents of NoHo SoHo, especially seniors aging in place and lower income Chinatown populations, all while opening the fragile district to big box retailers and new high rise corporate construction. 
In reality, the plan's upzoning provisions would assault affordable housing, and yet it is falsely packaged as a proposal to expand affordable housing. The many destructive impacts inherent in the city's plan have been exhaustively documented by many experts and community voices, including Manhattan Community Board 2's own detailed 40-page critique. The, through alternative the thoughtful alternative proposals have been ignored in the latest iteration of this plan. City planners are determined to push through this reckless rezoning during the last days of the de Blasio's regime, clearly to prevent any fresh review by the incoming mayor and city council. For all these reasons, and for this um, five or six specific areas of concern detailed below, Manhattan Community Board 2 rejects the city's fundamentally flawed and unacceptable SoHo NoHo neighborhood plan. That's a good start. Did you write yeah. that? Anita, did you write that? Yeah, I, I just read it. <laughs> she read it. I wrote it. Yes. I'm different. shy. First read. Oh, you like it? Good. Okay. I'll, I'll take anyone else? <laughs> Good. Well, I think I think it's great and just what uh, excellent beginning. Because the, the really I like it. Calling on. Yes. 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 Susan? Hi, uh, thank you. I, um, <clears throat> I'm very happy that Anita wrote this because I've, having watched the document evolve over the past week or so, what I felt before she wrote this at the end of the day today is that it became um, a dull read. And I thought that in the beginning, even, even though every point was strongly made, it had a consistency to it that blanded it out. And I felt in the beginning, we started out with something more impassioned, which I felt was really important and, and very well said and concise. So I think this recap or intro, whichever way you wanna look at it, is written in exactly the right tone. And then when it's followed by the more written by committee style of the Rezo after, um, I think that it balances it out. So I'm supportive of this. Did you have your hand raised? Can't mind to put you on the spot. Bright light behind her. Okay. Yeah, she's backlit. Um, so, has everyone spoken who wants to say new beginnings? Good. I like that. I have to say that um, I don't disagree with anything that you wrote. I just wonder who the audience is for that kind of writing. It doesn't seem like a rezo to me, and it seems more like a rebuttal of the something we would send to the daily news or something that we would send to the community, but it doesn't sound like something we would send to these. Well, maybe we need to change a little because nobody's been listening to us over there. Well, exactly. I mean, what difference does that make? I mean, now's our the final moment. You know, we're going down, you know, the trucks are coming to plow us over. Are we going to parse words to bland it out now? Are we going to take this last second and not really care whether it's exactly the style it's been done for years before or really, really represent the community and be impassioned. It's not even, you know, over the top impassioned, it's just concise six points. Yeah, and obviously this is the first draft, so we it's, can- It's exactly right. It's, I, I just wanted to make sure that the tone was something that uh, uh, the committee would be okay with, or some of us. A question, is this being called an introduction how is this, uh, will this be listed in, in the final resolution? I think, it, well, it's an introduction or it's just <clears throat> right up front, where so, uh, it's because we want to get right to it so we get some interest so uh, in reading it. I mean, this other stuff is very, very important, but it's very hard to. Uh, so we would take the stuff that's in the introduction now, combine, put this would be the introduction, and yeah. then we would have our six areas of concern after and those would be very much more rezo like um which you know a little more densely written and so forth which we have for uh, those of you who have uh by all means you know add your voice to it but uh i think we also need to make sure that people understand why uh after this long long uh process why we feel the way we do because it could get lost in here. And yeah. in fact, we don't see it the way it's been presented. That in fact, if you go a little deeper, it's not what it seems. Uh, to address uh, Frederica's point, it's a bit unorthodox to do that kind of a preamble to a resolution, admitted. 
we don't normally do that, but we have to understand in this room, and I think we have been talking this way, that our audience is wider than just the City Planning Commission. Our audience is our elected officials, our audience is who this goes to after it leaves City Planning, because we think that we're not going to get the best hearing from City Planning. So I think a preamble would be appropriate here, knowing that we're seeking a wider audience. We want people to understand why we're continuing the quote unquote fight once the resolution leaves city planning and moves into other hands. So I think it's, a, it's unorthodox, but I think it's highly appropriate in this case for us to use this as a preamble to the resolution. It also makes for good press. <laughs> Um, at Eugene, was, Eugene. Sir, I, I thought we had there was also a discussion of maybe having including all of the community letters in the resolution. Was that something we're still considering? I don't know how that's practical. There's hundreds. I mean, yeah, we just got a boatload today. Can I so to that one? We certainly want to include it. We also have testimonies from many organizations. Right. And uh, uh, we just got a new one from the New York Historic. Uh, so I guess the answer is we'd have to genericize the emails and take out people's yeah. personal information. Um, but Bob was going to take all the letters we received today and we could combine the them and put, we could theoretically put them as a PDF attachment. Can I, can I say something about that? Sure. It is very unlikely, mm -hmm. having been on the other side of the fence, that anyone will read those letters. They yes. want our resolution. Mm -hmm. If we have a preamble, they will read it. They're not going to read all the attachments. Chances are they will receive the same letters once it reaches, goes beyond goes us to them. them. They're going to get the same letters all over again. And I think we encourage the constituency to do the same. So although it may sound like a good idea, no one will ever read it. Is that really the point, though? Isn't it to show that there's been a lot of uh, response to this application? If it, or could we quantify it? I mean, it's certainly quantified. Yeah, quantified and yeah. how many letters came in. Right. List the names of the organizations that that or those that are willing. I mean, is everyone essentially willing to put their name in if they're if they submitted the letter? They're all willing. The organizations are all. A lot of what we've received though is not cut and dry. No, it's not. And I say you can't quantify. It's not cut and dry what we've received. So quantifying it. You mean pro or against? Or? I just say there's so much information. I, some of them are very sophisticated, very thought out, quite elaborate. Right. I'm just yeah. thinking some of the letters we've received in the last week or so. I mean, they're very, um, there's a lot of content. A lot. Yeah. I'm impressed. But they're not just cookie cutter, cookie cutter letters where everyone's cut and pasted. A lot of effort has gone into it. Yeah. But you have to open the document to know that. You do have to read it to know that. Yeah. <laughs> You have to open the document. Well, let's take a closer look at the letters and see what's possible at the office, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what's normally done. I mean, that must have come up well, in other. What Michael had said is, so if you, I've been looking at other resolutions. Yeah. That's a typical city planning resolution, if you wrote a letter opposing or supporting a rezoning, yeah. your letter will be in the permanent record at city planning commission. Not the one you wrote to community board too. So if you go, well, how do they get it? We send it to them and then they submit uh, it. So like uh, I wrote a letter on the Hudson Square rezoning. And if I go back and look at that, I'll see the resolution. I'll see the borough president's report. I'll see the community board's report. And then they'll add after that all of the other letters that they've received. And you said all the names are, are redacted? I don't know. I don't remember how they're redacted, but it's but you will find. So you name. don't want people don't sign their name to their letters? No, their names in there, not their personal email address or something. Oh, like oh, I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not like, right, right. Yeah. No, not phone numbers. Not phone addresses. numbers, exactly. Just to be close. It would still say Anita Brandt. Oh, all right. Because you've got to sign your letter. Not, otherwise, not you're person X. Anonymous. And the important <laughs> thing is the organizations that have submitted. Yes, and we have a And we lot. have a placeholder for a listing that, and maybe we have that as an, that might be just yes. an appendix or something. Can I, can I just make an observation? <clears throat> we have another audience in city council uh, that might be taking a look at this. You know, what is it, two thirds of the city council of Amos, right? Two thirds of the city council uh, who are going to vote on this will no longer be an elected official. Um, and so you mentioned that, and I don't know if ever such a last minute um, in the field of zoning in the historic district, uh, so late 
very Trumpian, you know, it's very, very uh, last minute. Uh, and I'm wondering how strong councilmatic preference is going to play into this. We have a chance of maybe breaking it down some. And this is a very optimistic view. But if there ever was a time to break down the like two thirds of the people don't have to live with it. Well, what does that mean to us? Well, I think the letters should be included. I think that even if it's even if it's weight on a scale, even if it's like saying, wait a minute, it's not my district, I'm up in the Bronx, but wait a second, do I have to go behind you on this? You know, and it's optimistic. I'm acknowledging that it's optimistic. Well, we're, we're keeping our optimism. <laughs> and also, all. This isn't our final set. We can continue to communicate through this. There's another audience, you know. And every three weeks, our world is changing still. Right. And, right. you know, it, it wouldn't hurt us to go to speak to see key members of the city council land use and zoning. It would not hurt us to go to either to me, you, Carter, me, anybody who has relationships. It would not hurt to say, listen. I know normally somatic preference is very strong, but you only got like another 60 days life in this. Country. This is a big issue. And let's take a look at it. Let me talk to you about it. Let me see if I can flip you on this. You know, and is that gonna happen? I don't know, but I think the letters are important. And, and I think that, you know, they're not gonna be receiving it. With due respect, or maybe city planning will, but it has to pass the city council too. We have a major shot, and Claudia, you're right. It's not our last shot, but we have a major shot at this. And I say it now because we're in August. It's four more months, they're out of office. And so let's take a look at this. Uh, you know, we have to ask Chris Monte to make a statement about guys, we are the future. I was just talking to somebody about it today. Chris has to say, we are the future. I am the future of this district. I am going to be the city council member of this district. I don't want this plan. I think it's a mistake to go behind yesterday's news trend and approve this. Let's take a shot at this. Put that in, right? That's in her. Yes. Okay. And I know we have, I mean, I should say we have representatives here from council member Carlina Rivera's office, council member Chin's office. And I guess that's it. And we have, um, from the elected officials. So we have Zella Jones from the, you know how it is. Yes. Yes. I'm not disagreeing. I'm asking if Chris Marte is voting on this. That's voting. It's not. Well, he's, what, in what capacity is he going to be advocating for? He's going to be the next city council district. Yeah. Well, and so what, in what capacity would he be advocating to his fellow in council? In what capacity? I don't As a council person? No. As the future council person. He yeah. is the future of this mm -hmm. district. So you think he'll reach out prior to being installed? I think installed. he needs to make a strong statement. Prior to being installed? Yes, being, being elected. Mm -hmm. There isn't anybody in the city council who doesn't think that the winner of the Democratic primary is mm -hmm. not going sure. to be elected. No, that, so I mean, This is one of the platforms he ran on, so that he's been speaking out on this. With, this is why he was elected, is that he represented I, uh, this view of the community. Who's that talking? Susan Wittenberg. Susan, okay, thank you for that. Yes, sorry, I should have identified myself. Hi, David. Is the full screen? Um, is the, the Zoom part? So he ran on this. I think it's appropriate, even though he's not been elected, uh, even though he's not been sworn in, to say that um, I have to live with the consequences of this vote. You don't. You'll be out of office. The mayor doesn't have to live with the consequences. I do. I am beseeching uh, the city council as a collegial in a collegial way to not adhere to the strict councilmatic preferences. Got it. Uh, present, present everything by saying it's optimistic. Before. I think that's a good point, but since he's not here, I think we should move on to the next topic. Okay. Or the next. Um, did somebody else? There was somebody else who raised their hand. Valerie, you had something. Or maybe. Uh, this was about the preamble and the idea that. Um, making the argument that I think it is for the press because whenever we're contacted about our position on an issue, we refer them to the resolution um, that was passed by the board. I think that's a good point. Good. I think we have to try something new. <laughs> so that's, 
And, and just to share, there's a yellow, a very casual sign-up sheet. Since now we're back to in-person, we no longer have Zoom registration. So for those of you from the public who are attending, just please fill this up um, so we have a record. I think one thing we'd like to uh, hear from our uh, board members who are not on the committee, and if they have any questions or if there's anything they would like us to focus on that we haven't, um, this would be a good time to, to ask or, or speak. I see that's uh, Chris and Robert and Suze and Gammy. Just maybe a few more. Um, yeah, no, okay. Any speakers, raise your hand. Chris, there he is. Hey, um, I, I guess this uh, sounds like it's not what everybody in the room wants to hear, but I'm, I'm on the same side as Michael and uh, Valerie. That can you speak a little slower? I can't. I can't hear your words. Sure. And a little louder, please. For sure. Sure. Is there volume? Which no, Carter's got the volume. He's turning you up. It's all the way up. Okay, now you're up. <laughs> uh, I I just wanted to say I'm on the same side as uh, Michael and Valerie that it doesn't serve benefit for the resolution to add the uh, letters. That's all I got. Okay. Okay. Bobby Lee, we want to hear from you. <laughs> there he is on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the middle of eating a, a, a croissant, but uh, I just want to tell you, tell you, tell you guys I fully support everything you're doing. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, I appreciate that. Susan, are you there? Gammy? Maybe she's having dinner. I'm with Bob Healy, full support. Okay. okay. Oh, that was Susan. And Akila, we'd love to hear from you. Everything all yeah. right, we haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> I know, I'm out here uh, packing at my grandmother's house, but um, I wanted to just say that um, I like the idea of, in, of including some letters. I think like a curated list of letters would be helpful, like letters from, you know, the historic, you know, society, like people who have a lot of knowledge about these issues. Um, I think that could be a, a very useful addendum. Yeah, it also shows, I mean, we are not experts in, in all of these issues. And we did look to the experts that uh, spoke up and came to our meetings and, uh, and we asked questions of, so it wasn't done in isolation. Well, what else do we need to talk about? Anything um, uh, specific? How about Susan? So, um, we Susan. Have, and we have Dr. Smith. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Dr. Smith. Hi. Um, I have not been really seeing, been, been, have been involved in a lot of the meetings. So I'm just, uh, it sounds great. I just, when you talk about those six areas, is that, would that take a, take a while to either talk about now or send that to me? I don't have enough. We should talk about No, that. let's definitely talk about it. It's the perfect time. Okay, and then I'll have more information. I don't want to make a I mean, we won't read it because it's too, too many pages, yeah. but we can talk about the outline yeah, yeah, of it. Just do the synopsis, a summary of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And yeah, Susan, I'll turn my mic. Susan spoke. She said something, right? Susan Gammy spoke. Yeah, yeah, I mean, then there's just whipping already in there. Yeah, go ahead, Don. Um, on the therefore, be, am I going out of order? Are we talking about this in a specific order or is it just general? Well, I, I want to hear from these two. We're talking, oh, okay. 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 Yeah, okay. We're talking big picture, and then we'll go into the six things. Okay. We just want to, we also want to make sure that we're not working in a vacuum, that we reached out to the other. Uh, okay, it's kind of an overall then. Um, you have affordable housing in this resolution 25 times. And so I think to really make a strong statement, since that's what we are getting hammered on, that's that we are against affordable housing, that you really need to make that right underneath rejects the city plans because it fails to expand affordable housing and put that in bold. Because I think that is your 
Yeah. It's our strongest argument. I think it needs to be up front. And I would even put a, um, a page break so that all goes on one page. Yeah, I, I like that. We're not quite at the page break. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was being optimistic. Yeah, so. like, well, I think they're I'm, correct. I'm with you on stylistic okay. page breaks, but we're not quite there. Okay. <laughs> I, I totally want to echo that. That is the strongest argument, is that this is not, not only not a housing plan, this is an anti-housing plan. Because by doing this on, on a complete neighborhood level, you are precluding the possibility of, of real housing discussions down the road. You've now made this a, a, a neighborhood that is just too desirable for commercial and retail development. It will never happen. And what this is becomes a template to go to other high value neighborhoods one after another. And what ends up happening, first of all, it aggravates the problem because it, the, the idea of, of a responsible housing plan has to have a timetable for when you start to see the units of housing. This actually pushes that down the road. There is never a timetable included. And what ends up happening? The only areas that you will then see are discussions of housing are the very communities the lower income communities that people have been saying it's unfair to start developing in. So it's, this is critical to, to, to explaining why this is so wrong. It's not just for us, this is wrong for every person who wants decent housing in this. And perhaps we split affordable housing and lack of affordable housing and displacement are together, but maybe we split those into two separate issues. Because yeah, I'm in favor of affordable housing, this 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 plan is just not going to deliver. It. Well, I mean, are we are we going to specific? I mean, is it specifically? I mean, should we call out MIH as as the specific? No. That is already so far into it. To me, it's That's like, just, okay. Uh, two in the details, right? I mean, yes, I agree, but I want to keep it simple mm -hmm. in the, uh, initially, and then we can back it up later. I do also want to pick up on what Valerie said about the idea that the audience is not just DCP. Why? Because the DCP's audience has never been just us. They have been working to a bigger, you know, an emotional argument that has been made to anybody who is interested in this topic. We have to do the same thing. This is the buzz, this is the red button. The housing and, and, and it's okay. not in writing, but Eric Botsford very specifically articulated verbally I think it was last October, the very first meeting, the reasoning for moving the plan forward. And I, I don't have the wor exact words, of, but he was very specific in that. And, and um, you know, looking at the goals, are these goals actually being met through this plan? And uh, I'd have to go back and look at that. A housing plan has housing goals. It doesn't have housing goals. Yeah. Well, yeah, well. Yeah. well, goals are easy to say. <laughs> results is what we're mattering. I mean, right now it's all, uh, yes, we're concerned. But in fact, when people uh, who are uh, skilled at looking at the code and the exceptions and the uh, various options, and because of the type of buildings that we have in this neighborhood, they're not really uh, easily suited to the MIH, for example, because of the footprint or the, the configuration of the site. So there are many, many ways where uh, you actually don't have to do uh, new affordable housing and it does uh, encourage the demolition of old buildings that are not protected by landmarks but do house a large uh, a number of, uh, of rent controlled or rent stabilized, I never get the difference, but uh, units. So those would be long time uh, neighbors would have to be moved out and we would then have uh, more construction, more demolition and not necessarily any more affordable housing. So it's not a good, uh, equation basically it's just not a good map so how do you feel about moving the key areas of concern right up in the front under after the preamble rather than having the process 
next. Yeah, we, oh, yeah, yeah. That, we just pulled that out lately because we realized that was, there were too many comments. You're absolutely it. right. Yeah. We could also put the process at the very end. Affordable. You're right up front. Concern is affordable. You want to go through each area of concern, at least just for now in the order that they are in the document? Yeah, definitely. I just want to go back to, you know, the affordable housing is a finite amount of space where and these numbers really can be developed. And the issue is how do you encourage the most use for those spaces? Even though, I mean, the, the, the idea of knocking down buildings is very different than what's available just to build on and the encouragement of what happens in those spaces. I mean, this is a very boring plan. It's very typical. It's, there's no imagination that's included in it. Um, there's nothing bold uh, from the city's perspective on, on encouraging any other types of uses and um, or even having a concept for that. It's taking, you know, what a plan that you have a new legislature and new mayor coming in, a new city council and a new mayor, then they may have better plans forward. And this is attaching it to a past plan that seems to have a, a lot of issues. And uniformly, we've heard issues even with how this plan is managed. We've heard that from a lot of people um, in even the target ranges of who, who the housing is affordable for. It's not necessarily reaching an audience that many people realize you know, is what are the affordability brackets? And- um, Everything's relative. Everything is relative. <laughs> yeah. And, um, in, you know, to, to not thoroughly look, and we had asked for them to look at this, and that's to not really thoroughly look at plans for the future that could develop more affordable housing in a, in a way that's, supported by the community seems to be um, a mistake. I mean, there's a lot of missing lines. opportunity. And, and also right now this, you know, just, just having a bold plan here, as far as having people come back to the city arts, you know, we constantly hear the arts is, and culture is, is the lead, um, is the lead issue that's going to bring people back. And that's not captured at all within this plan. And um, I'm not suggesting we provide solutions to the city, but that's just a, um, uh, you know, they should be presenting a comprehensive plan, but that kind of goes back to the point that we can look at each of these individual parts, but the parts do not roll up. And just because one part is tweaked, you know, you, you end up having problems in other parts of the plan. And that's where the issue is. We constantly heard that DCP or not constantly, we've heard from a number of the key players that DCP and even, you know, pro president Brewer had mentioned that DCP didn't work with them to get the plan into a better starting place. And that's what we're dealing with, you know, and um, wow. so many moving parts that it's, it's sure. in, it just don't seem to sync together. So, but we have to also keep in mind though, that this plan is on your clock and it's moving forward. And, um, you know, that's another as aspect of this. And, um, you know, it is gonna be addressed and is that uh, realistically, um, you know, where do we stand with that? And, you know, as city planning has told us over and over, this isn't our last chance. What you to comment about? on this. I'm just saying, this is what they've told us. Yeah, we can go to the hearing. And so, <laughs> yes. you know, so, yeah. so we look, need to be bold in our point right okay. now. That's it. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. clear. Michael's had his hand up for a while. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Frederick, after me. Sure. Let me comment on what I was saying, correct? We have to remember there was only one affordable housing tool, or to use this expression, in the toolbox for city planning that exists already. And that is legislation that created the mandated MIH program. And what they are proposing to do here is simply map Soho Noho, the special purpose district as MIH, in which MIH would apply. To think, so we, I think, are correct in our resolution in saying MIH does not work in this community. That's as far as we can go now. For, and it's something that we do not like, and we ask you to go back to the drawing board, and I think we're doing it right. 
There is nothing else that they can do between now and when they hold their public hearing and when they send it to the borough president and when they send it to the city council, there's nothing else they can turn to to produce affordable housing in the special purpose district other than the already existing MIH tool. Remember, it's already legislation. They'd have to go back to the drawing board. They'd have to progress some form of legislation, go back to the alert process, and they would never be able to do it in time for this administration to adopt it. So I just reiterate again that what we've done here, I think, is outstanding. And we've said the simplest thing possible, MIH, as it is currently constituted, as it is currently an active program, does not work in this community, period. That's I think we've done a great job in saying it in this resolution. Frederick, I'm sorry, did I? No, I'm sorry. I, I uh, blurted out. Uh, Yes, there'll be other stages of this, but how many other opportunities will the community board get to vote? One. One. So whatever we say after the vote, is, are we really going to feel that we're speaking for the community board if it's not on record someplace and not included in the RISA? If they come to us and ask us, well, how do you feel about X or Y? And we're and it's getting down to the nitty gritty and we don't have any uh, modifications I would love to have that would be a classy problem because I don't think we've gotten a lot of calls over the years mm -hmm. saying <laughs> I just so I you know like I just that was say that this is the time for the for the community for the resident to really uh, represent the the full fleshed out vision or or uh, vision of the of this of the well let me give you a couple of examples process. as a new board member um, I kind of pushed my way into getting involved in the Hudson Square rezoning and suggested that since there was no outdoor recreation opportunity to mitigate active open space, we pushed for indoor recreation uh, and, and made it into the CB2 resolution. And we testified at city, city planning and city council on these, I testified at city planning as myself, at city council as part of the team with David and I think Rich and Kakapolo and others. Uh, and it ultimately was is included in the new school space. Um, it's not exactly what we wanted. So, and nobody called and said, "Do you want twenty four hundred square feet?" We got it. Yeah. We got it, but we did get it in as a space, and then it was a variety of things. So we got it in there, but it wasn't. It was definitely a victory. But the point is, we it wasn't exactly what we wanted oh, was it in the resolution yes it was in the resolution yeah, and that's, and that's we're, we're point, responding right? to dcp right now we can of course have another resolution after this if we needed to, have to our city yeah, council right. yeah there's no okay. this is not a definitive no, just said, okay. so well, I, I just i the want DCP. us to get stuck on this because the, let me just be let's talk about timing the borough yeah. president our our timing is our time ends monday the 26th monday. and then she has until 30 days 30 days so august 26 we've asked for a meeting um i've asked via email twice in person twice and i called two people on her staff and as we were starting exact matthew washington called me back but i haven't thought we're going to talk tomorrow so hopefully community board two will get a meeting with um gail brewer and her team um, so that's one. I reached out to and we talked to Anthony. And I talked last night. Sent an email. Hopefully, we'll get an e a meeting with Council Member Chen's office. Um, I spoke to Edith Su Chen this morning. That was more of a casual conversation. Um, so we're going to continue to push as much as we can. And um, in terms of timing, City Planning has not calendared this yet, but it might be. So this is a good heads up for everyone. Wednesday, September 1st, which is the Wednesday before Charmaine. Labor Day week weekend. Everybody oh, takes off. Yeah, it's pretty much the week where everybody the takes off. Holiday week. Unless you have a high school student who plays sports because they have to be back in New York City. So you'll be there. I will be there. <laughs> but, uh, but normally, I've never been in the city that Neither week. have I. <laughs> and I don't take in much vacation. So. I don't either. So just to give you guys yeah. an idea. So that's it's been pushed through very quickly. Because it could be at a later date because city planning has 45 days. I also think that one of the characteristics of, and again, I'm speaking for myself. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure it's reflected here, but is that the premise, the basis, uh, the organizing principle of this uh, plan is faulty. 
And it, there are so many uh, enormous issues that it's not like we can say, well, we want it a little smaller here or maybe a little bigger here. We're talking about destroying a, our most precious national treasure. I mean, the whole world is looking at us and we are, uh, they, they are planning to compromise very unique preserved neighborhood and it's not like, well, just destroy, just, just destroy it a little bit, you know. But Anita, do we have an alternative, which Frederick is recommending, to NIH? Is there something, and I, I can't think of any, is I there something we can include in our resolution that says NIH does not work in this neighborhood, would not work in this proposed special purpose district? Do we, as a community board, have an alternative that we could recommend for consideration the City Planning Commission can amend the plan uh, before it sends it on to the City Council. Do we have something that we could recommend as an alternative to MIH? Well, in the resolution, we suggest evaluating alternatives. But these are not all in their tool, but I'll read them. Incentivizing adaptive reuse and sustainability. Two, converting empty hotels and offices to affordable housing. Um, the state did allocate some funding for that. Three, constructing 100% affordable housing on the underutilized federal parking lot at 2 Howard Street. Four, acquiring and subsidizing the development of 100% affordable housing on sites within the rezoning area. And the only thing we didn't include were ideas, I guess, more akin to what um, Controller Stringer had proposed in his mayoral plan, which is some version of spot rezoning um, tax breaks by city lot for development. I think we have to do whatever it takes. But what I mean, we have to do another ULIP on MIH. We could do that too, but they're not. The, I, I, we can do They redo. What, why? what about the hotel thing? We did it for one neighborhood and then we went through and they did it again. So why can't we ask for that? We can put that on the list. Why don't we put it at the top of the list? So our last bid finally resolved in our response to the draft state of work was that we recommend the DPCP study and offer affordable housing alternatives to MIH. You know, we've about this much success in the response from DCP. The scheduling, I don't know, Janine, if you want to speak to this, the scheduling of that September 1st meeting, if in fact they are giving uh, any public information, which uh, from which you needed relate to me, that they generally would indicate in advance some time period right ahead of any change. They would admit any changes that city planning would vote on would have to be publicly noticed 15 days before the meeting. So September 1st, any oh, change so, would so, basically need to be in place by September, August 15th. Which mean, this means that they're not going to be taking into account for a president testimony, mm -hmm. which means they're not interested in listening. So they, we have a repeat pattern of this consistently occurring. There was so much response to the original draft scope, you know, from so many groups laying out so many different issues. That's just, you know, I, I, I look to you just pointing that out because there's an underlying assumption that there's an ear at the other end processing and putting this back out. And that's what we've consistently heard is not occurring. Well, we so tried. We offices, did try. We have yeah. tried, you know, from state representatives have chimed in. And so I, right. you know, at this point, where are we with right. that? And that's and, why I feel that what we're writing is not for DCP. I take your point about the, the preamble, right? It's, it is passionate and there's nothing the matter with passion. But beyond that, we're writing, we're writing for city council. Right. writing for and people and that, people and they're not all so that, able to read something really really dry so that we put up on the website right that we, that we a letter to the community saying oh, this was like for us you know what the reasons are for for what we did but this is this is really addressed to city council in in my mind Okay, so we I'm, already did a 40 page reso. That I don't think that we need yeah, to. This is about five. You did that already. Did okay, you did that already. Um, one quick, I didn't, Michael, I read you that list. Was that along the lines of what you were thinking? It was along the lines of what I was thinking, but it, it's lacking one major element. What would you add? No, which is financing. 
who would pay for it, who would manage it, how would it, how would it be targeted to the area we're talking about. So we listed a series of actions that could be taken, but it's not a program. No, it's not a program because, and frankly, even the biggest uh, you know, supporter of MIH in his report by the Manhattan Institute just that it needs to be paired with city subsidies or it won't work. See, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a part of it. And maybe we should strengthen. Maybe we should put that in there. Strengthen the footnote. say that it needs I love that. It needs an administrative location, an administrative home, in order for these ideas to be packaged as a program, as an alternative to MIH. I think that's the kind of creative thinking that Frederick is asking for. We're saying there are other things you can do in the as part of this list, give us funding, give us an administrative home better in this community than MIH. We, we heard about this though, and we were told this was part of the toolkit as one of the information sessions that the gentleman from, um, I think he was HPD, HPD, HPD. He, he, you know, as in saying the tools, however, the subsidies come as a separate program to further make things affordable. It doesn't start with the lower rents, but that's part of a larger program that's not targeted to any specific community. It's targeted to individuals. That was my understanding uh, to meet those requirements. So it is a tool that they do already have. And had there been a better way, we probably would have seen some more information from the city on that in this plan. I don't disagree because I really started thinking about that a lot. And if somebody doesn't meet, if those subsidies stop, that is a problem. But I think that's really too far down, okay. Carter, frankly. I think all we have to do is say that we want to have uh, plan is an unacceptable substitute for direct city investment in increasing affordable housing. And we want to see increased public housing initiatives to support 100% permanently affordable new buildings in Silver and Noah. Let them figure it out. Well, I'm not sure. I'm just right? responding. Is that in there or are you yeah. adding something? This is something that I sent to you uh, a couple of days ago. I okay. Can I was, you put it in just, the, it's a, it sounded good. Can you put it in the document? Because I don't have the ability to take other documents. I mean, I do, but I don't have enough hours in a day. So if you have a good comment, you put it in the document. Uh -huh. Directly in there. Um, okay, so after our what we're calling a preamble, I, I I'm hoping to jump in for a second. Oh, Sorry. Sure. Uh, so according to this thing called the Fair Cloth Amendment, there will no there there's no possibility for 100% affordable housing in any city in the nation. So it's not a possibility. However, there are certain things in New York City available to us called the ELLA programs, the extremely low and low income affordability program, as well as the senior affordable rental apartments program. And all of these are already subsidized by the city. However, if I've misheard all of these things, because I am a visual learner and I haven't seen all of these things firsthand, I just, all I can tell you is that the Fair Cloth Amendment guarantees that there will not be 100% affordable housing in New York City. Yeah, I think you're right. I just want to clarify, Faircloth Amendment would be no additional NYCHA public housing, um, but the programs that you're talking about, Chris, <laughs> absolutely right, that there are existing programs under HPD that offers, that are subsidy programs where private developers would receive city subsidies to develop, in most cases, 100% affordable housing. So you still get 100% affordable housing, it's just done by a private developer. Um, so that's, these are just different programs. So you are right on both, but just somebody else on our- that's, that's what Matthew was talking about, Matthew Metzger. He was talking about- Yeah, that there were private developers that were interested in building- Yes, so private uh, developers building. So the majority of the affordable housing that is built in New York City, if it's 100% affordable housing, it's usually on city-owned land or city-acquired land. And then it is developed by a private developer, either a not-for-profit or for-profit company. It's also the only, in my simple thinking, it's the only way where you actually make an impact on getting some units and not completely annihilating a, a historic district where there'll be very few numbers so of- the, uh, the problem is even when HPD presented these programs, we heard no commitment to work with city planning 
to include it in a revised version of the plan if we feel that MIH doesn't work. So therefore, I think we're on the right track. I'm not sure how okay. to say this, but to strengthen the section where we talk about alternatives and ask for some sort of guidance in putting together a program that would work better in our community. I think we're on solid ground here. Okay, great. Uh, just uh, just for a reference point, there is a, a bill that was introduced in the House of Representatives by um, AOC uh, in February of 2021 to repeal the Fair Cloth Act, but it's only been introduced. Yeah, and I don't know. It hasn't gotten much mileage. So, so we don't have to solve the world's problem, right. but we do have to point out the flaws of what was presented to us. That, I think, is uh, at least the minimal. Right. Does your, does the... Uh, Rezo have say anything about all of the offsite and payment in lieu? Yes, as another way of not building a, affordable housing in our neighborhood. Are we going to take a position on that or just say? Uh, oh, it just says it's another way of not. Do we not want that? It. No, no, I so can't remember. I want to eliminate those. Can we just look it up? I don't remember. I've been through so many. Okay, can maybe we go instead of hopping around? Why don't we go through? point by point. And let's just start in the order that they're currently in the document. And the first one is one near and dear to you is increases in FAR, um, the little race, the historic, um, and once historic districts and fundamentally transform Soho, no ho. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, which is I'm not sure where it is. The one, um, we don't have to read it, but sort of maybe just highlight the key areas. Uh, um, I, I, I don't want to derail the conversation, but I, I Go ahead. mentioned Soho, Noho. What about Chinatown? I mean, because that's that's been like the part, I mean, that, yeah, that, that's, that's the area that's, you know, if you look at the DC plan, that's, they're, they're well, maybe we can 40%. To call it something different. Yeah, hey. We actually don't need to name, we're commenting on the city Soho neighborhood plan, but our title of our resolution can be opposition to rezoning. Mm -hmm. Those three neighborhoods. Can you just mention what's the percentage again? I, it's forty-one percent. So forty-one percent of the ZFA will be coming from four or five, four full blocks, two half blocks in Chinatown, uh, that southeast border, which is not, which is not Soho. And, yeah, very and important. So, oh, it's, I don't need to it, it's. I mean, anyway, you know, for all the talk of zoning a rich neighborhood, that's not what they're doing. I mean, it's they're getting the housing from Chinatown and it's been completely left out of the title it's completely been left out of any of the discussions but I mean that I mean we were the area right outside PS 130 where we met last time I mean that is where all of this is going to be built. absolutely it's, and right. it's left out of all yeah, and the attacks on us too yeah it only and came at the 11th hour that it, somebody brought it you know really focused in on it or maybe you knew all along but it's really yeah, so good thank, you, thank you to anthony and, and eugene for pointing this out and looking it up so um and anthony can you remind us how many people attended the residential outreach meeting during the Envision Soho Noho process for the residents in that area? So for the Chinatown one in April 2019, there was just one resident who attended. And who was that? <laughs> Whom I encouraged to attend because I couldn't attend just to make sure that there was, you know, proper amount of outreach and voices present. And she told me she was the only one who attended. Yeah. The meeting that took place at the Museum of Chinese America on Center Street. Um, and, and she attended was, because of outreach or because you asked her to? Because I told her. <laughs> yeah. There was someone there present, or else there wouldn't have been anybody present. Wow. Oh and, my goodness. And since then, have there been any other outreach to residents? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. <sighs> That's a footnote. So, um, what? Are we finished with that? Um, well, yes. Um, but did did Eugene hey, did we put the data in here? Well, since we're on this topic, one, I you want to just read that or? Oh yeah, I put it in the in the. I have it at here handy. Okay. Um, so in the resolution, we know that there's 635 rent state rent regulated units in 105 buildings, and 43 percent are in opportunity areas. 39% are in the Soho NoHo cores. Those are the sort of pink areas. And 17% are on the Broadway Houston corridor and 2% are on Canal Street. And we should probably show that side by side with the total zoning square feet 
that will be developed in each of those spaces in this percentage of total, which I have the old version, I haven't updated the new version, but that would probably put it in perspective. I have those numbers because I updated the spreadsheet we used in December. Oh, okay. Um, so um, yeah, I can I can put those numbers in. Okay, and maybe there's a way to like graphic put a little oh, picture. Yeah, I think you mentioned a pie graph. Yeah, pie chart or something. I can do that if you don't want to. But uh, but some way to you know because somebody might look at the picture, they might not read the words. We have a visual learner right here, so Chris might go straight to the picture. Whatever <laughs> delays the information what? the fastest. Bob has this. Oh, Bob Ely. Yes, Bob. Um, Finish that croissant. <laughs> I, I finished it a while ago. I just wanted to say, and I was just, I was just going to send it in the uh, chat. So I what? completely, I completely agree with Eugene. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, thank you. I That's all I want. To say. I just think it's like should be right in front. Yes. Yeah, I think we should really also put in our resolution the lack of outreach to the Chinatown community on this issue, the lack of, you know, you cannot in good faith create this kind of plan without speaking to, or even, you know, having in-depth conversations with the community. And I, I think that should be in there, um, in, our, in, our, in our thing here. Might even be required. Yeah, I mean, I think that's criminal. I mean, it's, it's criminal and it's racist. It's insane to me. Okay. No, this is a kind of whitewash. <laughs> it's not, it's not, no, it is. The most vulnerable are being overlooked. They're not even mentioned. And they're not even mentioned. Right. We have the obligation to bring this up. And it's more than being overlooked. I mean, we know that Sylvia, when she was asked this question directly at the city, at the hearing, the commissioner's hearing, would there be displa displacement? Um, she said no, because most of the buildings in the stud in the area are basically the cast iron buildings in Soho. I mean, she just talked about white. I mean, she just brushed it aside as if it was a ridiculous question. And then at a later meeting, the last one, that's when she said that the community um, concerns on this er area were insincere. All right. Yeah. thinking and insincere. And, and, I mean, and it's a finding in the Envision Soho Noho report is that there should be more outreach. I mean, did they even try, you know, um, outreach in Mandarin, outreach in any language other than English either? I mean, that's just horrendous. It should not be acceptable at all. True. There was a member from the public at that last our last public meeting. I, I believe he went first, but he had said there was not any news or any placements in Chinese media, uh, I, which is which is you know he had asked for. Um, <coughs> so you know that I think he had said that they just weren't aware that this was going on. I mean, there's a historic uh, aspect to this too, is that Chinatown just keeps getting divided, divided, divided on all these issues, right? I mean, that was the whole, you know, is divided personally, but you know, that was one of the reasons that they put together separate groups that were combined of di different representatives of different king boards to speak about these issues in a more holistic fashion instead of constantly dividing them on on lines and in this case it's just being divided on a zoning line again um and not including anybody in that conversation it seems in a meaningful fashion also also carter to your point people don't remember is that they divided up chinatown into at least three different community boards mm -hmm. mm -hmm. good point that's really the value there, of course, that you know the impact. It's a kind of gerrymandering, and it is gerrymandering. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this also ties into what David was saying the outgoing council person who should have been community has, has got no, no, no skin in the game anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, why, why would she but, bother? You know, I just want to say it's a little disingenuous to keep saying that because they weren't even consulted by DCP before the scope was released. And that's incredibly important to keep in mind, which is why 
and I, I can't repeat this enough, it is outrageous that DCP did not present us with a better starting place to discuss this. And that is why we cannot resolve it for them because they've started in such a different place without taking in our elected officials. And now there's a burden on our elected officials to take a position on something that is so you know, erratic in its inconsistencies at this point when you change the little areas that, and we're being asked in a larger issue that's politicized to weigh in on it when, and the, the community ends up with the burden of this, everybody's willing to talk about this more. We've shown that the community keeps showing up, but the place we're starting in is is terrible, and and you know to try to tweak a terrible plan, and this is where we end up with the differences from the community groups. But we're starting in such a bad place. Who ends up fixing it? City planning doesn't listen, and that's the agency that should be presenting us with a starting point that we can have discussions about. They're the professional agency, and they didn't take any input. They are also supposed to represent the community that they serve, aren't they? I mean, and, and, and you know, to, to their point and what the answer would be, well, we represent the city. Okay, but you still have to take into account the, 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 you know, all parties of the community. And one of the parties that has a big stake are the current people there. You know that they're immediately impacted. You know, that's something that we hear people saying they're speaking for the people who aren't represented. I don't discount that. But at the same time, they've completely discounted the input from the community board, from residential groups, from, from you know, professional groups, from housing groups. And that's, uh, I don't expect any difference coming out of this. And I think that it's a tremendous burden. It's a little, I'm a little taken aback by some of the comments about talking to other city council members when we have our own city council member who hasn't been listened to in this process. And that's, you know, starting point we need to be aware of that um, because it's unfair to, to you know jump ahead in this i think in in that respect yeah um, so. okay um, good, point. good point carter oh, susan has her susan oh no it's a mistake sorry okay thank you my, my last is, is i'm just i guess i'm just concerned that there's there's been no voice for um, those residents. I mean, of all of the letters and statements and people coming to testify, I mean, how many are from Chinatown residents or Chinatownists? I mean, it, it just, it just, it's, it's not for the amount of housing that they're expected to contribute. It's, you know, there's been no voice. Oh, and the sacrifice. This is not. Uh... Stay in place and we'll renovate around you. Oh, no, right. This is, I mean, this is an upheaval. This is a tearing away of your neighborhood. Yeah. And I, I want to share that I did get a polite, but you know, a call after our meeting that we had at PS 130 saying that they were frustrated that the translator only translated for the Chinese speaker and not for the rest of the meeting. And I said, uh, you know, because it wasn't a professional. And apparently she didn't do a very good job translating. And, you know, but she's not a professional translator. She's an engineer who happens to be Chinese, who they grabbed at the last minute. And we had reached out to, I mean, for community boards are not offered translation services. And we reached out to the mayor's office and we kind of got this, you know, good luck. Um, you know, and, and, and frankly, I know translators are hard to get because they do often have them for school meetings um, for the, or the, the school board, citywide school board. And there was one meeting I went to where there was a ruckus for an hour and a half because the translators, missed, nobody was, nobody showed up. And I went out and <laughs> I went Found and someone? came, no, I went out and came back. I like met someone for, it was like 6.30, I hadn't had dinner. I went, let me go get Well, something. we're glad for what we did get. Yeah, we did. Because at least we got a presence and, and, yes. and we can say that we tried to. Uh, so it was very frustrating and I don't have an easy solution for that because we don't have access to translators, but we do need to, um, you know, perhaps, you know, I'm going to follow up. Perhaps plan we can. ahead. Too. Well, I don't know. I don't think we were going to. Just going back, I'm just looking at the time. Just did the, yeah. the, um, we're the five areas. Yeah, let's go through the five yeah. areas. I mean, I, I'm not. Can, can Anita lead this? Yeah. Sure. Well, uh, number one, I'm just going to read the headlines first and then we can go back because you want to see the whole picture. 
key areas of concern. Number one, increases in floor area ratio will erase the historic of the once historic districts and fundamentally transform, and we should say, Chinatown. Those, yeah, Chinatown, Soho, and Noho. And number two, affordable housing goals are unlikely to be met. And number three is a JLWQA conversion fee of 100 per square, uh, dollars per square foot will eliminate this legal special use, letting it die a natural or buy, uh, buy out fuel death. That's a quote from uh, one of our um, one of our experts. <laughs> uh, and number four, zoning changes will squeeze out small scale retail, art and unique, and unique boutiques. Number five, the uh, city's plan offers no mitigation measures to the significant adverse impacts on open space, shadows, historic and cultural resources, transportation and construction. And then if we decide to put something in about the uh, process, which might also be a place to discuss that there wasn't enough outreach and that we were short on time and whatever else uh, we have outlined there. And then I'm just gonna read the therefore be it resolved. And then we can go into the different items. Therefore be it resolved, the community board two rejects the city's plan because it fails to A, protect the so Soho Noho historic districts. And actually we should just say historic districts because we also have the Sullivan Street Thompson and there's five districts or something. So, so that's, that's not in the project zone. Though. It's not in the project zone. Oh, it's okay. just this we ones should, in Soho. We, no. we should put a number in there. Be I mean, five. Just, just four. Yeah. Expand, uh, that was four. We'll count, we'll confirm. The expand, well, it's more generic. It's a historic district that's being uh, uh, unprotected. Expand affordable housing, however, unlikely in the near term at the expense of commercial and dormitory uses and protect against displacement, particularly for residents in Chinatown, seniors aging in place and tenants who are rent stabilized, rent controlled or currently protected under New York state loft law. C, secure the future of the JLWQA use and instead seeks to change a punitive tax on current residents. Charge. Oh, charge, mm -hmm. sorry, charge on current residents, many of whom are seniors aging in place. D, strengthen the unique mixed use neighborhood, particularly eliminating retail caps that threaten small businesses and removing eating and drinking caps. These changes will negatively impact the expanding residential community and will allow eating and drinking on otherwise quiet residential streets. And E, mitigate the impact of the city's plan on active open space, shadows, historic and cultural resources, transportation and construction. Uh, and two, joins with tenant groups, preservationists and other highly respected organizations across the city in opposing the city's plan that financially benefits property owners and does not take into account the negative long-term effects of this plan. So those are our uh, overhead captions. So we have uh, FAR, affordable housing, JLWQA, uh, changes to the commercial retail and uh, you know big box stores and other things like that um, no mitigation they say all these all these terrible things are going to happen and apparently michael tells me well they just have to identify it they don't have to solve anything that's true which is really pretty crazy yeah. and then that's it I, I you know one area that is addressed in a couple of these, but I think we might want to consider pulling out is uh, quality of life impacts. That even though we keep hearing that zoning is a blunt tool, it is not properly addressed some really obvious areas that directly come from the zoning. For example, a lot of the issues that's mentioned around uh, large scale retail. Uh, another issue is commercial outdoor uses, which is increasingly, you know, in conflict with the envelopes of residential. Um, 
and particularly rooftop uses is something that's uh, that's not dealt with. Um, and obviously the uh, the eating and drinking related uses or catering uses, which uh, are, you know, that's what the board hears about all the time. Yeah, uh, well, and all the pollution and added congestion, and, there's a lot of quality of life issues. Yeah, and, and, uh, and look, I mean, the area of the bid's been working on this for five years, we don't have anything. Yeah. You know, so it just should be pulled out separately. I think the Zone point is user. last night's meeting, most of the, the open restaurants that people were complaining about last night, most of them are not allowed in Soho at, at the moment. And that's with that exactly zoning text point, amendment, going to see yeah. That's gonna expand yeah that. so which is why we didn't see a lot. We saw some people from what, you know, the McDougal side, McDougal you know, near to the west side of Soho. And we saw in Little Italy, that's Nolita right. residents, but there weren't, you know, there's Finelli's. <laughs> well, by design, I mean, Soho has not wanted that. Yes, but, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Are there anybody that they broke up the historic core and the historic corridor and and amped up the FAR on the corridor? I'm, I'm against any going. increase so, at all with on the FAR. It's into you know we've waited for Eugene I think to to talk about this, but if we want to talk about um, addressing this through the overall building heights. It's, you know. Why don't we just say we don't want to do that? That's we what it says. Yeah. No, we can, but so also one of the, to... Well, I mean, I think it's just important to to point out the existing street wall height is is an important number. Yeah, we are flipping realize, around a little bit, so. so thank you for getting us back. Let's stay on item one, which is the historic so and, the mean, FAR. and the FAR. And the FAR. Yeah, that is. I don't think we have to drill down to the building height. I think if we could say. We object to splitting up the. Well, that's a step. There's two separate issues, but Dr. Smith has her hand up. Thank you. Um, when you were reading out those points, um, you talked about, if, if I heard you correctly, that it did not meet the the goals of the affordable housing. What were the what What are the goals of affordable housing according to them? I think the goal of the plan is to provide more affordable housing. It's not quantified that I can remember, and it's also not guaranteed. It's just a general uh, goal that sort of is, is, is the motivator, uh, a big selling point of the plan, when in fact there's, it, there's very little substance to it. And, okay. and Thank you. And, they did and put out a number. It's nine hundred, right? I mean, yeah. oh yeah, that's right. nine hundred. So that's and, actually that's not the correct number. The correct number. The plan looks at what is expected to happen at twenty six sites over the next ten years, and that is three hundred seventy two to four hundred something units of affordable housing. The nine hundred number unit is looking at what is the adding the twenty six sites with 58 projected sites. And that is apples to oranges because the entire EIS, EIS only looks at the 26 sites, which is also very misleading since in New York City real estate, if it's available and the price is right, it will be done. It has nothing to do, we can't decide what- It's trickle down economics. Yeah. And, and, so that it will, the, the numbers are 1,861 total units of housing that will produce from 382 to 573 units. In a perfect world, doing everything that is not uh, yeah. uh, prohibited. In other words, there's so many ways of not building affordable housing that that is very unlikely. And, and Dr. Smith, just to follow up on that, a number of the sites are already known to have other plans in place that people say they're moving forward on or other limitations that we know these are probably not realistic for some of these sites, even though they fall into the city's criteria of being allowed to present them that way. And there's also the consideration that we could lose more affordable housing on the way to achieving some affordable housing. Absolutely, that's the irony of it all. That's an frankly. important point. You could, this could result in a net loss. And we actually have that in that is in here. I think that's very so, unfortunately, tragically true. It's, okay. There, it's 
Quite. So in terms of the, the objectives of the plan, just to be specific, it says promote economic recovery, resiliency, and growth by allowing a wider range of commercial facility, commercial, commercial facility and light industrial uses. So basically this is recovery for big businesses that can build 10,000 square foot in larger retail establishments. It's recovery for large restaurants that can build 5,000 square feet or greater restaurants. It's recovery for organizations that wanna build dormitories because those are not currently allowed I'm not sure what light industrial uses would be. Expand housing opportunities. But also resiliency, it is actually not being resilient because as part of this plan, you would be uh, tearing down existing building stock. Yeah. And instead of uh, preserving it and building new, even if you do super duper leads, it would be uh, more fossil fuel consumption. Yeah. Um, establish appropriate densities and textual, contextual building envelopes that ensure new development harmonizes with the neighborhood. We're saying that's obviously not happening. Um, promote the concert preservation of historic resources and adaptive reuse of existing buildings. Are you reading from this? No, I'm reading from the city's goals. Shouldn't we work on the right zone? Um, so, so the question was, what are the goals? And the last one is celebrate so Ho no Ho's evolving role in the city creative economy by continuing to accommodate, anyway, celebrate is basically tax, joint living, working, yeah. order residents for artists and move the money into an art fund to give to other groups. Okay. Yeah. Thank those you. Are the, those and, are the five objectives that the city has. And, and, I, and I would say, you know, one of the most astounding things that I, and I, I should have read it right before this meeting, but it's like they uh, were talking about the amount of jobs created by one of these large places, which was slow mo, was it whatever that place is? I don't know, Susan, this, remember the this? slime place? Yeah, the slime place. And there are what five <laughs> permanent jobs and and three hundred, you know, part time jobs. And I'm not sure how creating all those part time jobs really contributes to the issues that we have, which we need our full time jobs with benefits for, with benefits for people. And um, you know, this is just sort of this hyper hyper gig economy, which doesn't provide stability for people yes. through having full time jobs. And that's a was just in the paper, you mm -hmm. know, is a, is a big deal. And okay. I just Yeah. So do we have so yeah. in the FAR thing where what it talks about is it's too big and um, the proposed increase in FAR will allow vertical expansion of buildings, new towers, and um, we and and also put the onus on landmarks to deny oversized uh, additions and um, and they're not equipped. That's not their job. So we're basically, but we, what we don't have in here is we're opposed to splitting or increasing the FIR of the historic districts. We don't have that in here and we don't have what Eugene is working on, which is the current building, you know, majority of the buildings on, there's very few buildings that are over 10 or 12 stories along the Bradway corridor. No, they're all from the 1890s. That's why. Well, yeah. Hi, um, Margaret Chin just tweeted out a yes. joint statement. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, Eugene just shared it with me. Do you want to read it? Eugene, you want to read it? No. You shared it. <laughs> well, you guys are multitasking. I know. Social media coming in on us. Um, I, I think I need reading glasses. You, you, beat by, you, beat, you beat me by seven minutes. Oh, my <laughs> 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 Are you right to the man? Here we go. Okay, let's hear. Right, let's hear. hear. Read. Okay. Do you want to read it, Eugene? I have it on my phone. If you can, you want to read it? Yes. Uh, let's see. I can read it. I can read it. Okay. okay. Don't make him squint. He's squinting. It's <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like just. Uh, the homes aren't long enough. I know. You can put it up on the screen. No, no, no. We want to make one. It's just the same with uh, Margaret Chen and Carlina Rivera on um, so no rezoning. Um, we want to make one thing absolutely clear when it comes to the DCP proposal on Soho Noho rezoning. Affordable inclusionary housing shouldn't be an option. It should be the only option, regardless of the larger issues with the MIH program, which the de Blasio administration has refused to review in its remaining time in office. The fact remains that DCP has not addressed real issues raised by sincere housing and community advocates. Um, these advocates have tried earnestly to work with the city and recently announced her serious concern for the current proposal ahead of CB2's advisory vote on this proposal. While there's unfortunately been a fair share of fear mongering and disrespect 
shown during this discussion, the outright disregard of groups like Cooper Square Committee and NOHOGA Bowery stakeholders from DCP is incredibly troubling to us. Uh, we care very strongly about not only building affordable housing, but preserving the affordable housing that already exists within rezoning lines, yes. as well as in the surrounding neighborhoods. Good. Um, at a time when our city is desperately in need of affordable homes, particularly in wealthy, centrally located neighborhoods where no new affordable housing has been built and no affordable units currently exist, we must do better. Uh, we call on DCP to return to the table now, not in three or four months, with real plans for how the SOHO NOHO plan can guarantee the most affordable housing possible for our communities. We must have real and clear direction in the next month in order to address key issues more sufficiently prior to city planning commission hearings. Okay, so if that were me, I think our reso should be, we agree with this, period. <laughs> Well, <laughs> nothing else. I don't think we're going to get because, I, because then we don't have to say anything about anything. Because it doesn't cover all the issues or resolutions. It's a, it's a very important really, statement, but it's we not. We really want to prioritize affordable housing, get that piece in place, and then all, let everything else fall into place behind that. All we have to do is endorse our position. That's we've just read that position, but that position is very important for one of the five, six points we have here. It addresses affordable housing and addresses displacement. It doesn't address the JLQWA. It doesn't address zoning changes um, and it doesn't address mitigation and it doesn't address historic districts. So it's a very important statement that hits on one of our five or six areas. And it's very important, but it's not the only Absolutely. aspect of this thing. So it's great, it's, though. It's, very good. it's a great statement, but it's also a tweet. Okay. So we need her to make statements like that in more secure platforms in front of officials. Agreed, but it's on stationary. That's fine. It's on stage, but she tweeted it. So who is she sending? No, 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 it's, a, it's a picture attachment a picture. or a PDF attachment. Oh, so a pic I'm not. Like, okay, I can't see I'll all that. It, yeah. <laughs> it is an official. I'll send it to everyone whose phone okay. number I have in my phone, which is most. You know, it's, <laughs> it's more than we've had so far on any of our issues. Yeah. So that's yeah, that acknowledge that this is being recognized by cool. those in the trenches. You know, representing yeah, a community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get back to this because we got to get through this. Everybody <laughs> has to get some. Uh, Anita, can we go back to the issue of the FAR? Are we or are we not going to comment on reducing the FAR, reducing the building heights? I have your approach here. We know that we don't like what they're proposing, but I'm a little bit lost about how the group feels about how much we get into the detail of whether or not it should be one of uh, uh, why they're separating out the core from the corridor, and should we be asking for lower FAR? Should we be asking for lower building heights? What is the general feeling of the group? I, I think that we should comment on the street wall height being 85 feet because it's there for a reason. It was based on the majority of the buildings and not the outliers, and it's an important consideration. Before elevators, just, just so, so people understand the number, and um, and I say that because when you have the existing number to understand what it's based on it makes clear any other suggestions why so we are out of recommending lower building heights based upon we are in the well that's the supposed district uh, they are proposing well i don't say, say say it should be kept which you know the, the existing street wall was decided you know was determined to be 85 feet based on the historic buildings and the historic context. I'm not saying that we suggest that's the height and that's the height limit, but it's pointing that out so that those looking at any other numbers understand the basis for the street wall. That so was you want to add that in historically. I'm adding this in the comments. So we would right? point I mean, out that the basis for the street wall is 85 feet. I don't know. I don't understand why we have to add FAR to the historic corridor or any place. If it's to do affordable housing, well, we just realize that that's not giving us affordable housing. It's is it? Minimal. It's, it's to revitalize the economy. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should do revitalize the economy on the backs of cast iron buildings. Right in that historic core, it's so minimal what can be produced, and the outliers yes. and the exceptions and all the other things come into play. 
to the nth degree. As an architect, if you touch a building, you've done a lot. Well, adding a floor, adding two, these are very uh, invasive, very, uh, um, uh, uh, it's not a good idea. Not for the benefits that right. you got. Maybe for a penthouse for somebody, but it's not, it's not I mean, gonna solve I mean, any problem. I mean, what about the opportunity areas that are not in the historic district? Are we going to comment on that? In the not historic districts? Yeah, I also think we can't have increased Again, I'm speaking for myself, but you can't uh, throw on an FAR increase in those little areas of Chinatown and expect it not to change and uh, displace all the people. So it's a bad idea. The FAR increase is a bad idea unless it's for some specifically beneficial reason that solves a lot of problems. Then it would be something on a, a site by site. Yes, if you want to talk, I mean, shouldn't it be first you decide how you're going to get your housing and then determine if you need the FAR? It's not the other way around. What they're doing is raising an FAR and then saying, oh, yes, this will, if you if you raise the, the number, it will come. I mean, it's, it's a vehicle okay. for tearing down it's, small buildings. It really is. It's a very, very conscious decision, in my opinion. I think anybody would know that, oh my God, this is like a gold mine. This little footprint is now worth. It's too tempting not to do it. It is, it's, a, it's New York, it's money, it's real estate. It's inevitable. So I think if you put that appetizer out, it will cause a lot of. Uh, Don't say appetizer, I'm kind of hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> if you put that shit out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, oh, I had enough with vermin. I couldn't sleep last night. Here, have some more cherry. Um, <laughs> affordable housing goals. I think uh, we talked about that. I'm sure there's more to say. What about uh, joint lived work? Do you want to talk about that, Susan? You're really uh, the most uh, up on that. Well, you know, I'm happy to try to talk about it, but. It's an area that um, is the hardest to get our heads around because it has so many implications. And, you know, I've liked Alexander um, Neratov. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly. I mean, to me, of all the things I've read, that did the best job of describing um, one of the problems, aside from our point of view about it, that was inaccurate in the city's proposal is how exorbitantly expensive it is for buildings to switch from um, one form of housing code to another. And that it's just not, again, it's one of these things that's not thought through. It's not realistic. That's it's right. filled with- You don't do them one at a time. You do the whole building at one time because having a CFO change is quite costly and the whole building has to be brought up to perfection. And yeah. it's a and it, and it will time. Happen. Yeah, it, it's not real. you know, a few buildings that might be able to do it, but it, they made it sound, you know, it, it's it's one of these things they just tossed out that had, you know, it, it, I, guess it, I would it, call it, this it, their it, magical it. thinking. Um, Let me add some information I got on that later, right before I came. I spoke to Alexander Naratov for about five minutes and he's available tomorrow afternoon. So if we want to talk to him again, um, but he, he basically said, um, there's two ways, his view is there's two ways you can change the definition of a artist, um, or you can remove the curatorial aspect of it. So it's just anyone who works from home. And he thinks that's, you know, it's a mixed use space, it's live work, it's lower carbon footprint, it's a green direction. Um, and he thinks this is where the value is. So it's in our, if people travel to work, their homes are sitting empty by day and their offices are sitting empty by night and weekends. And so he kind of talked about that. He said he would, um, I mean, got into some of the weeds on this. Um, and he also pointed out what you were saying, Susan, the biggest problem is subdividing buildings. Um, he said there probably would be need to be some adjustments to Article 7B, but these changes, because this is the only neighborhood with JLQWA, would be unique to this new uh, mixed di mixed use district. Uh, so those were some initial comments that I got from him. And then I sent many people an email 
Um, I spoke to Edith this morning. She mentioned that it was modeled after funds created in the theater district and the East Midtown district, which I have a different note. You're talking about the, 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 the money? Yeah, the, 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 in East Midtown in 2017, they created a PRIF, Public Realm Improvement Fund. Uh, it's basically the the massive upzoning, and you can trade tra development rights with throughout the district. And when you sell them, uh, there's lots of weeds, but it's 20% of the sale price. And in the theater sub district, they created a theater, theater sub district fund in 2016, it was also 20%. And I did a quick Google um, and six square feet. There was um, a note that the tax averages, I don't know how they calculated this, $61.49 per square foot, which I thought was fairly precise. I <laughs> should say. <laughs> yes, Frederica. I think we should uh, comment on the arts fund uh, fee only applying to. I do think that's a good topic, and that's a good thing to point. We can finish talking about the first aspect of this is the calculation of it and the definition of it before moving on. I think that's a good point. Well, the mission is a problem because right now it is joint living work quarters for artists. And you mentioned a moment ago, why not make it for anyone who works at home? So that would require something we haven't seen yet. And that would be zoning tax change to redefine. And right now it is in the manufacturing zoning text of use group 17B. So we would be talking about a revision to a manufacturing use group that would then define anyone who works at home as this use, whatever we're going to call it, JLQWM makers. Um, so we're talking about asking for additional changes by the Department of City Planning uh, in the zoning text amendment that we've heard, which would then relate to the um, fund that they propose creating for conversion of such units into um, use group two. So there's a lot going on here. That, it, so which, it, which are we recommending? Couldn't it be just again? And, uh, it, this is thrown together in a way that perhaps it doesn't need to be. In other words, that specific issue, which is the problem, I think, with the whole plan, is it threw together a couple of problems, and and they're not really necessarily related. In this case, you do a zoning text amendment only separate from this rezoning plan and you solve that problem because it's been going on for a long time and and uh is is that something you think we would so, so the so I'm just, I'm just, are you recommend changing my state law artist is defined in state law it's in the multiple dwelling law in section 276. yeah and that's why so, alexander said it would require changes to article 7. and we've known we've known all along that it would require follow-up legislation by the state so are we going to recommend that or not i don't know how the group feels this that you your comments at the landmarks meeting had me thinking about this quite a bit which is the order in which things were done and it would seem to me that you investigate the state legislation first on this and what's possible and then come to the zoning as opposed to the other way around to make sure it's completely encapsulated and that was really important is the order in which things are done so that they can be fully uh, contemplated because the benefit always goes to the wrong party in the end if it's not written properly right and that so I just bring that up because I'm not sure doing it after the fact fully contemplates. So what the current, right. so let me make sure I understand yeah. this. The city's proposal and everything we're talking about here, and maybe some ideas that have been thrown out by these experts, all would require follow-up changes to um, state legislation. Re and well, no, I'm sorry, not, as it, not as it stands now. No. Right now, there would be no follow-up required in state legislation because all they're saying is you would apply to the buildings to convert from use group 7B to use group 2. That's it. Use group 7. Oh, as it's written. Right. And there's no change required in state legislation to do anything else, to redefine occupants of JLQWA, to redefine a JLQWA, to figure out what would be required to make it be code would all require changes to the state law. So what we've seen from city planning is a very simple proposal. 
just allow them to apply to the Department of Buildings for a change in the certificate of occupancy, and therefore they will pay into a fund, which will be administered somehow by HPD or whatever. We're not clear as to how that would work. That doesn't require it. Any other change that we might recommend in the definition of the occupants of such units, any expansion of how we define them would require an equivalent change in state legislation. And what Carl was saying, that should have come first before we would know if we could put it into the zone. So we're a little bit stuck here. What it is that we want to recommend in this resolution? Well, we are commenting that this plan would have all these unintended consequences of you know, all the different DOB filings and code compliance and other changes required. Now, so Alexander Naratov and, our, and other architects like Anita say that is the case. Even city planning says that's not the case. Yeah, and I, you know, I- I'm not an expert. Is, this is one of the things. So the whole idea of the conversion, right, is that you believe you can't sell your unit. So you convert. You, you have to come contemplate that so far in advance under reality and front all the costs plus the time delay if you're wanting to sell or whatever, that it's not realistic and is a reasonable solution to those people who feel that they're stuck. And that the, the, there is not an equivalency of a manufacturing use residential use to a residential use under use group two, correct? Because the, I, I, there may be. There's a lot of things right. that can come up in the actual reality of it. In other words, these are not residential properties. They weren't designed to be. Right. They've got no windows. They've got no light. They've got one big space, ideally, and people chop them up and make all these bedrooms and all that. But that's not according to the uh, to the use group two code. So it's not a simple thing. It could be get it could mean they have, they have to tear out their whole apartment or loft in order to, you know, it's a big deal. I don't think anybody's really thought about what happens when you change use on a space that wasn't designed to be that use. But they have to come up to like ADA compliance. I mean is that all of that stuff. Yes. That's there's no there's no wiggle room. That's why I don't like the standard use group two, because it's designed for, you know. Any any building that has an elevator is required to have internal. Actual, to have even a, without elevators, I hate to tell you. Yeah. Okay. Everybody has to design with it. Everybody. Yeah. Brian, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Pardon? You can redesign it. Right? We got to face it right up front. It's a most important issue that's what everybody's trying to sell the public. Yes. Yeah. But it's also being sold as if it was a vacuum instead of being in a historic district. And so they're pushing affordable housing as a possibility as if there was no historic district. So we're hitting all those points. I, I think we're really going in the right direction. I was thinking about the code plan. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take the big picture. Yeah, the big too. picture. I, you know, this is exactly this is this was, this was solving one the problem. small thing. Um, if we, you know, even though they said time and again that they were going to protect the artists who lived in their spaces and <clears throat> everything will be the same for them, okay. I don't see how that's true if you change from the M zone to either commercial or residential, because it's only the M zone, the manufacturing that protects the artists in their lofts currently from doing things that might bother their neighbors in a residential building. The oil paint can't smell, you can't hear the sculptures banging on the metal or the wood or whatever. And that, you know, when they, on one hand, they say, oh, we're protecting the artists in the neighborhood, but just that change alone wipes them out. I mean, how can they live and work in their spaces if they've lost the ability to do that? It's also, we'll keep it cool, by the way. Part of what makes it interesting is, you know, uh, it's got that cachet of I work in my loft and you're just taking everything and making it mundane and generic and, yeah, exactly. There, I mean, there's also the displacement. I mean, the pressure. I mean, I think someone brought it up at one of the public meetings, but I mean, co-ops are run by majority votes. Absolutely. So as we get new residents, they can force, they could force a wholesale conversion of everyone. Right. Since there's 
Yeah, they will. In fact, very good chance. Yeah, each time. The other huge, huge problem, and there is not clarity on this, and and both sides could be right, is that, and, and this was brought to light by the city, is that they said that um, basically loft law tenants are equivalent of use group two if they've been registered with HPD. And that's that's a big, big issue because if you look at some of the different loft law cases, you see different different outcomes in the building CFOs. And without a full vetting of what exactly those issues are in understanding that, the unintended consequences are unknown and those are regulated residents. And it was, I've looked at some newer cases and some older cases and, you, and I've looked more at newer cases. Artist isn't brought up in law talk cases because the windows have to do with a different law, which is the loft law. And that has nothing to do with the underlying zoning. And it supersedes, from my understanding, the zoning. So if you, for people who've taken advantage of the windows, 82, 84, most recently in 2010, I looked at a case I mean, when you say windows, not windows out looking out, you're window. mean, no, no, you mean windows the windows of, of legalization. Occupancy. Right. So you had to have three or more units in a building occupied. It's a you multiple only, dwelling right. law for lofts. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's making them safe and legal that people can live in it. It's sort of the baseline and, minimum. And what's interesting is if you go to talk to anybody who's really familiar with the law flaw, they say, well, I know nothing about JLWQA because you don't need to. And, and the reason for that is because you're protected in a different statute in a different format. Now, there are, what's interesting about that is that you have old units which have a CFO that say JLWQA, and you have new units that have an asterisk if they've come out of IMD and they're registered. And it does says that there's a, I forget the exact language, but it, it, it basically says the unit is JLWQA, but waves the A part of it. And then they'll, I send the language to anybody specific. You can look at 640 Broadway at the CFO there for an example of it. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's not fully explained, discussed, Etc. cetera. And, and the reason it's an issue is that the uh, case, which Susan, you might remember the name of the, the precedent setting case for uh, landlord occupancy is based on that they're not an artist. But if that's on, you know, we don't know what, what is exactly happening. And it may be that both sides are right, but we don't know. And as a result, you don't know the consequence, the unintended consequences of what happens to tenants in those units to other aspects of rent stabilization law because that's the law that supersedes the underlying zoning. And when we asked HPD to clarify it, they didn't answer us. That's right. They told us not to. Not to worry about not it. Not to worry about it. And, and they made an equivalency, which I brought up multiple times between a manufacturing use and a residential use of which there are different requirements. And just the mixing of these issues is one of the biggest red flags to looking at the current tenants and their protections. And also, interestingly enough, in answering their concerns about the future, because who can take over the units in a succession case? If you're not required to meet the requirements of JLWQA, you've removed that concern. And if you're required to meet it, that concern is magnified. And by not having a thorough understanding of this at this point in the process is, you know- Unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And it goes to what we consistently heard, which is do not harm the existing protected tenants in, in rent regulated units. And so- And it's not a simple matter. And, and I'm not I saying- got a headache just thinking about this. Answer, just highlighted <laughs> there are huge issues there. Um, it should be known. I, mean, I think it's telling that this part wasn't in the draft, right? I mean, this, this whole conversion part came just in May, right? The whole mechanism. It came when they announced they certified on the 20th. Exactly. So it the discussions last year. Well, it's also not really, it's not good enough. It's I mean, it's just not good enough. It just hasn't gone deep enough to solve the problem. 
So repeat, where does that put us with what we're saying? Okay, so... Um, I like well, Michael, he gets us back. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Pull us back in. <laughs> this, this goes into another area with more certain, you know, highlighting the problems, right, of what we've been presented of a known issue that came from the very beginning. It's, it's, it's when we, you know, the few of us, I guess a couple of us were sitting in the room, it's why the pie chart in one of their plans that separates out law flaw tenants from JLWQA units may be separated out. And they would never answer that question of why are these two separate sections in the pie chart? So do you want to add language on that, Anita? And or, and I'm, I'm going to lean on somebody else because I, I don't understand it um, uh, well enough. Yeah, no, no, I, I started writing it, but I, I'll... Uh, okay, there's something in here. The precursors of it. Um, are we, and I'm going to... I do think it's financially punitive for everyone, but it, particularly for senior citizens who are aging in place. And I just wanted to... Are you addressing my comment? Yes. I wasn't saying it was punitive for everybody. I was saying, did we want to apply that fee to every conversion, whether it's from joint live work to to uh, use group two or from commercial to residential or manufacturing to anything. Well, I, I had asked Sylvia about that, why other, con why other changes aren't taxed. And her answer was that the other changes, the other uses are allowed under a zoning, they just require a special permit. Or 17D, as this long conversation we have, the definition doesn't allow residential use. So get around that, then I ask, well, can you change the definition and solve this problem much easier with a zoning text change on the definition? I think we can ask for it, but I think we need to be nice to have another conversation with Alexander. Maybe a side conversation uh, with, <laughs> some people the expert. Sitting, with some experts sitting in this room once we finish business session. And, and, and another thing that's been raised to me, and, and we heard a little bit about it, because everybody hates this, so that's what we heard as a predominant voice. But it also um, penalizes people who are complying with the law right now versus those who are looking for this as a solution to become compliant. And that is, uh, you know, a big issue as well. Um, in that, those that are legally compliant have taken the, the pains to become compliant over time, versus or those stay who compliant. or stay compliant, whatever it is, versus those who have not become compliant. There's been no incentive to become compliant either, and. It, that's an issue that we should raise. I'm not suggesting that we have a recommendation on it, but it really highlights those that have done the work, that have gone through IMD, that have legalized their building and spent years and years and years in limbo without that benefit. You know, it takes away any, any recognition of that work. And I was speaking to somebody and they talked about the stress during that time period and the many, many years Why that it took. Prisoners of their own mm -hmm. homes now. Well, well, also that they went through this and they're the ones who, who took the, that risk and then followed through on the entire process to the end. And that is no different than a storefront that has gone through the special permit process and took the time for a year um, to market, et cetera, and all, you know, all the, the various requirements. And, you know, we hear it today, it was a lot cheaper to do that 15 years ago because the rent that you for, you know, that you, that you didn't take versus the taxes, et cetera, or even 30 years ago was significantly less than it is now, the hardship that was there. So I think that that's something that uh, speaks to the people who pioneered and saw through their buildings and their units. And it's, uh, yeah. I'm not suggesting a solution. I'm just saying it should be okay. pointed out. Let's work on that. I, mean, yeah, I just, since that. we're in this, um, I'm going to, um, Carter, you noted that the active ocean space fund is not a good example. And I'm going to, I mean, I've, I've, I haven't read the theater district one because that was an amendment. So I think they've been selling 
air well, rights. What are you talking about? Okay, now? the yeah. active or still under jail. The active. You had written that the active, the active open space fund, which is part of the Hudson Square rezoning, right. is five dollars per square foot, and that was in the rezoning plan because of the need to mitigate op active open space. And I did not have time to look up the theater district, but I did look quickly. Now that I have it bookmarked, um, the the um, Greater East Midtown rezoning. One of the mitigations was the Im, um, impact on the public realm. Adding all these people to Midtown, the sidewalks and the subways would be too crowded. So there was a problem identified in Seeker in the techno in, in the EIS. Too many people, and then they create a fund that was mitigating that problem. Um, in Hudson Square, problem open space, fund mitigates it. In this case, when I asked Sylvia what problem is this trying to mitigate, um, and this gets back to a conversation we had the other day, she said people want it to have a way to legalize their units, and this is what we've been talking about for a long time, and they want it to you know, celebrate. She didn't use the word celebrate, but um, re um, respect or further the legacy of the arts in Soho. Um, which is not a mitigate, which is not an identified problem in the EIS. But didn't you quote Hudson, the Hudson Square thing just to, to bring up the $5 number? Yeah, and then so, since then I've done more research that it was also mitigate. I'm just trying to say these other taxes are tied to mitigation. Right, but let's just focus on the number. Well, let's focus on both, because I'm saying, why are we even having this? It goes back to what Michael said, which is the mechanism is not out. And therefore, you can't, it's not in the EIS because there's nothing in this plan to mitigate for, number one. Number two, the uh, both of those other spaces, the open space, you weren't taking away open space. You were adding people, you were which adding, mitigates the problem. And, 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 and in Midtown, you were adding people. In Hudson Square, you were you adding, were, people. Uh, you were adding people, not taking away open space. And you're here, adding people as well. No, well, here, that's not what it's mitigating. What you're doing is you're removing art space, the space for the creation of art. And that's what it's mitigating. And it's not going back into the neighborhood. And that's a, that's a distinction. I mean, that's the mitigation. Well, right? then it's our point of view that we don't want the arts fund. Like, where uh, are we I, I, I'm not the rest of the on the cost or on the or on the but we keep of bringing the in these other areas that don't come back to the. To, to I hear you. You're removing changes. space for creating art, and and you're replacing it with money to fund the art. And and I, you know, I brought this up a number of times, but this is a very important consideration because it's the underlying point of the whole entire district. That is why this district was created. And so, as a solution, I don't think this this captures the spirit at all which is what it goes to what I said before, is that there is no bold plan to preserve the arts, to promote the arts. There's nothing here except a simple plan presented by the city with this solution that's been I mean, to a problem that's been identified from the very beginning that somebody thought of for- Okay, so do we want to- Let's do has his hand. Yeah, let's do it. Sorry. So, so the theater, so the other two districts, though, isn't the mechanism, I mean, it's, it's different. That's, that's transferable, that's transfer of development rights, which is, you're basically, I don't know about the tech, the theater district, but the East Midtown rezoning was a massive upzoning. So they created value. Right. And then when they're trading the value, they're taxing 20% of it. But, but this, what they proposed, what DCP's proposed, and what we asked at meetings was, when does this happen? Does it happen at sale? And they said, it doesn't happen at sale. It has to happen before. That seems different because yeah. then if I'm selling my- You aren't well, creating any cash value. Well, first I need to find one hundred fifty or two hundred thousand dollars. Exactly. Go to DOB to change this, and I don't. You know, I haven't sold the unit yet. I mean, where where are people going to get the money to convert? Yeah, and that's more of a problem with the mechanism. And we should talk. Do we even want this? I mean, but just that's that's just that's mechanic. That's which just is a big problem. Feet. That's like has nothing to do with any of the other filing or any other changes. So that. Fee does not solve your other issues, which Anita has brought up. I mean, it's it's it, this is so not thought out. Okay, with Sam, I know it's not thought out. Let's, let's, we know it's not thought out, so let's just focus on questions or answers. I don't have either. I just have a comment. Yes, one, which which is just you know the joint with Fourth Quarters for artists for individuals creating art, having money going into some fund that that is for some cultural institutions or something, 
does nothing in my mind for what this artists. neighborhood is, is created around, which was, which was a central arts district based on artists, individual people being there making art, not museums that everybody went to as a tourist district. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I have a huge problem with the fund because it's not, it's not getting new artists in, it's not funding a new artist to come into the space, it's funding people, from what I understand, get see art stuff. And also, you know, who knows? Beyond, who knows? Who knows? And who knows? The Museum of Ice Cream, cultural. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rika? So, why don't we just say we're not in favor of making a profit on uh, the removal of art in a district that's famous for art? I like that. But what does that even mean, though? Well, Who's making a profit? The city's the making city. a profit. We don't take, no no the city's not making a profit. They're taking the money to do something else. Profit, call it something else, but that's the general point, right? It's not, it doesn't it doesn't we don't we're not we don't want to reward. To me, it's making a profit because that money what was the second profit. part of what you said? For the re, for removal the, of art. Removal of art in a district that's famous for the creation of art. But, but here's the thing that there's nothing here that okay. Well, I'm that gonna be to be okay, yeah. Um, hey Carter, I know it's very problematic, so I would like us to. Wait, focus but nobody here understands the arts district, and I'm just looking at Michael. He wrote the legislation yeah. that was a part of that. To not respect that is to not respect at all. Okay, what we're so doing. I'm looking. And for to dismiss language. that, I'm sorry, you're 100 percent off the mark. I think you got. I'm speaking here for a lot of people in this community yeah. who truly, their entire lives. I'm the young one. You know they. <laughs> you, you can't even they can't even express themselves when they come to our meeting how important this is that their spaces this is their livelihood they're not they, their livelihood meaning this is where they their live identity. their identity and, and to not address that this is just being you know a, an idea that was come up with at the last minute is a disservice to everybody and i just uh, can, you know uh, can i say something here yes because i i haven't said very much not knowing the way out of this those of us who were at the Envision Soho Noho heard artists saying we want a way to legalize our uh, residential use. And they came up with what they thought was the plan. The proposal written by the consultant was create pathways to legalize existing residences. They have come up with a plan, and I've said this before, that doesn't work. It is a flawed plan, it's a punitive plan, as you have stated so beautifully, it is true. It is one more step in the destruction of the arts community downtown that we worked so hard to create in 1971 and which took off on its own without any assistance from the city of New York and thrived for decades. And what they've done is they've created a mechanism that will slowly eat away at the arts community and give us nothing in return. No way are we replacing the arts community that it could threaten. By the establishment of a fund of this nature, we have no idea where the money will go. If it goes to a museum, it's not preserving the arts community downtown that we created. And I'm going to say this again in 1971, which then became a self created arts community over the past 50 years. I think, and I may be going off base here, I think we need to say we are opposed to this fund, period. It doesn't solve the problem we heard, it doesn't create an equitable way for the arts community to legalize their occupancy of this buildings. It's punitive and it, and it will not work. I'm okay. just throwing out here that perhaps we should oppose it completely because of the damage it could do. And I'm wondering if Susan would agree with me. Who said something? I, I, I said I agree with Michael uh, completely on that. I did so. I, I wasn't alive in 1971, but I was born here in 1976 to two artists who moved to this neighborhood and went through all of the things that everyone's commenting on about, um, lived their whole lives. And this change does nothing but destabilize mm -hmm. every one of my parents' friends who are here and still occupy their units as artists. And it's I probably knew some of them. 
Yeah. Well, is yeah, there that's... anything on this in this plan that we do like? Because I have the same yeah. feeling about I, just about every item. But I uh, feel that's... like the arts. I feel honestly, the arts fund is punitive and frankly an insult. Uh, it is salt in the wound. You are taking away these protected units. You are, it is so, the inequity is so disgusting. And then you're just creating a fund. It's, it's salt uh, in the wound of this. And it disappears forever. You'll never see that. You don't know and what it is. The fund does what? I mean, it's so obscure and it's, and it's, it's horribly dehumanizing. You are, you know, you're really, um, you know, destabilizing and in like all the things that Carter said too, this is not thought out at all. And you are messing, they are messing with zoning that they have no understanding of. That's right. You know? and, and Sylvia has said that so many times at meetings, she's not an expert in JLWQA. Whenever this comes up. And don't touch said, it. I am hey. not an expert. And you, you should not be put in charge of something you don't understand and then have and then impact so many people's lives. It's just it's cruelty. I think it guts the neighborhood. It, it, it just guts the neighborhood. And it, it is a slap in the face for people. I mean, there are people in my building that you know, there's a woman in my building who got our CFO in 77 and she said she spent every day walking down the street to DOB, sitting, waiting, going back and forth every day. She invested a whole year of her life just getting the CFO. I can't hear you. I think you guys muted yourselves on. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're agreeing with you, Akila. 100%. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Summary. Human error. And what you said was well. Another vulnerable population. <laughs> all right do we want to talk about are we ready to move on because i think we where are we've we got time? enough here and we can tweet it. let's talk about the um tent the caps ten thousand five thousand square foot oh yes 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 i want to bring up one thing about this retail i know i brought it up with you but i think it's an important point um if i'm correct dob does not count the basement in their square footage and, and uh, Janine was researching Hudson Square, was it? What was mm -hmm. it? That they have a 10,000 cap on ground floor. But we have been asking, and maybe this is where we stop that, but there's a confusion because in many of our documents, we say basement and ground floor. Yeah, we were working toward that. I know, I know. We and knew I'm, it wasn't the, We knew it wasn't the rule, but we were. I know, but my, I, I have a point to make, yes. And my point is that we could, for example, point that out. And if, if necessary, we can go up in square foot because they're going to use the basements anyway. Or we stick to that, but this is half of what is actually explained in the uh, existing 10,000 square feet. Right, we've halved it. That's a lot. Do so. the basements, do the loading dock requirements apply to basement selling space or only to above ground selling I, space? I believe they're the whole space. And then the 10,000 is, am I- Old space? The whole, whole. Entire. The entire, entire oh. space. Well, it should, it has so to. I, I think it was the whole space, but the 10,000 square you. foot special permit yeah. is for the above. It wasn't a straight line. That's what it was. It wasn't that simple. Yeah. Right. Loading birth. The loading birth. birth is the whole. Well, we call that out here because we talked about it yesterday, but it wasn't a straight line in the zoning document. So, so one of the things that this is in conflict, right, with the historic district and the special permit addresses places where, you know, the, the outliers where this might need to be addressed. It also gives people an opportunity to set up additional uh, quality of life issues that don't belong in the zoning resolution. In other words, as in a special uh, permit. We've been talking about these mitigation for 
oversized retail and we haven't seen anything. So anyway, we are opposed to that. I just wanted to bring up this 10,000 square foot issue. Go, go, Akila. Go I just had a question about, um, cause I read in the statement about this basement issue. I thought that the basement wasn't counted because many basements in our community, they don't have two exits. So you can't safely get, you can't have customers in the basement. I thought basements were mostly used for storage if a store had them. Well, historically, but not people anymore. Raise, some people have other not means. anymore. Okay. So that, that two means of egress. You have to have one and then and which I think most of them do have. And then you can go through a lobby or another. I mean it's uh, uh, it's, it's okay. the, the main issue is basements weren't air conditioned, weren't lit. That's why we have all those beautiful glass uh, eyes on the sidewalk. That's why they were used as storage only because you couldn't. <coughs> right. There was no electricity when they were. Right. Or nothing uh, enough. Not, not, no. Oh, oh, I thought there was an egress issue for base. Well, it could be. It could be. I don't know. But like all the stuff, I'm like Uniqlo, like Muji, all of them use their basement. Yeah. They all do now. Every store I can think of. And, so and the new target the that's coming is going to be ground floor basement. and sub basement. Sub -basement. Yeah, but Uniqlo, Uniqlo, and all of yes, because there are three, there are three staircases that can take you out of the basement. But that's a very Muji, large Muji. store. So many other buildings. Yeah, building ten thousand square feet is big too. By the way, We've yeah, it's huge. That way, it's huge. Not compliant. <laughs> yeah, they probably right. don't have fire travel. Um, but, but it, you know, I was struck, you know, Janine had brought up the list. I mean, how many use group 10? There are 11 spaces? currently. Yeah, there are 11 currently. And we're creating so much retail space through, you know, the city is looking to create so much retail square footage. Here Crazy. As of right. And then on top of that, adding in use group 10. And we see constantly these conflicts of use group 10 um, undermining small retail in yeah. areas. And so, the fact that they're allowed as of right doesn't seem consistent. I think our city council member has taken a stance against use group 10 a number of times. Uh, the borough president has. Um, I, I think we heard that, from Chinatown at the last hearing, which you yeah. went out, that they were strongly opposed that because it's going to hurt all the small businesses in Chinatown. Yeah, and, and so I, I, the special I agree. Is a, la as a, is a useful tool. Isn't, and isn't the special permit? It's not just. Here it's the citywide, correct? It's, it's citywide. So I think that it's not out of the ordinary um, to expect that to stand. And, no. and if people are using their basements, I mean, you know, this is for the outsider buildings. Maybe that is okay. I, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth, but for the buildings that are that size, they're the same ones that you know might apply for the special permit, but. Um, well, it's a big difference. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Frederica, Just clarify the loading dock regulations of the yeah. two basement. Awesome. Oh, good. Okay. Right. So, and, and those address, I mean, the massive amount of retail that's being created here as of right. Crazy. You know, from the quality of life issues, it needs, you know, to be commented on. And no, there have been no solutions, and this will only magnify. And perhaps there should be a requirement for storage areas. Yes, for I, I don't know enough about that, but that's well. It also different. destroys uh, neighborhood context, and that is one of the requirements that you have to be sensitive to. And having you know the gap and baby gap and <laughs> what other generic uh, stores that are, by the way, all closing up too. I mean Macy's, and you know it's it's not going the direction of the trend. Instead. Uh, how are you going to draw this back to the? Are you going to incorporate this to the Rezo and what part of the neighborhood plan is? Well, it's the, the Rezo specifically um, opposes the 10,000 square foot, eliminating the cap. Um, it, it, um, lifting the cap. Lifting, it, it, yes. Um, and we can make opposes lifting. Right. We, we should probably it. make it. We should, we should probably change, we should yeah. change it. Um, we want to enforce the use of loading berth requirements based on total retail space, regardless where it's located. Um, we oppose lifting the 5,000 square foot cap and specifically highlight 
in the report that 40% of the current floor area of the entire rezoning area is residential and you're going to add more people to this district. Um, so you're going to only have more comp you're only going to have more quality of life issues. Just in the two, instead of instead of uh, fixing on the 5,000 square feet limit for the eating and drinking. Yeah, about 200. Well, CB2, I put, the language here says CB2 supports maintaining a special permit for eating and drinking establishments above 5,000 square feet or seating capacity above 200 as required. I don't know. I mean, we can pull that out. Um, we could, or maybe put that as a footnote because that, those were just the two most recent ones. It's usually either, either yeah. threshold, either threshold is right. a special permit. So either you're above 5,000 square feet or you're above 200 seating capacity, you need a- Oh, we got it covered that way. That's but, good. But don't forget, in the special permit, we can always include provisions for, and they call the conditions of, for the grant of a special permit. What are the things we'd like to see? No music, uh, the two egress. Exactly. Not, not to be located on the ground floor of a residential building, not to be located in a mid-block location. There are so many things we can ask be conditions of a special permit, which exists in the zoning resolution. It's there for so many other special permits. We can ask for more protections we to sell or no home. Yes. And, and it's also where um, for commercial eating and drinking uses and rooftops, you know, that's the rooftops too. That's a, because, you know, the passive use of rooftops is one thing. The active use of rooftops is a huge conflict. And um, that's something that we really should specifically note because. Um, it's the trend, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's also where we see all the conflicts. We know that this is a conflict and it is an issue. And, um, Well, it's, it's a, again, that's a complicated issue too, because there is no open space. So rooftops allow for, uh, but that's not mitigating. That's not mitigating because it's for a commercial endeavor. It's, it's commercial greed to use the rooftop. It's but it's also with residential people who might. That's a passive use. That's passive. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Out of line it's, here. It's a big difference, but it's, it's it. important because if we look to anything, we know these are the issues. And it's, it's a simple solution now to a known problem. Well, we never did complain about special permits. I mean, that is why we have a big issue with this. This is creating problems where there were none in many ways. This is creating problems and not solving them when there are specific problems that instigated this. And that's a big issue. It's just starting off in the wrong foot. Okay. Um, and then we have one comment in here about the sandwiching issue, which I think adequately addresses the oh, concerns we've heard, mass, mass mass which we've heard from the community. Yeah. What? It goes without saying, right? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm just saying I don't want to spend any time on it. If somebody wants to improve that language, oh, yeah, please right. do so. Um, and then mitigation, I just want to raise one issue, and I never got a proper answer from city plan. In fact, the answer we got today was it's going to be addressed between the EI, the draft and the final EIS, which means well, whatever. That means we're, you're not going to give us any information. So the um, looked at mitigation options for open space, which we discussed at the last meeting, and I remain concerned that there'll be some public realm Um Issues, you know, I've heard. What do you mean with that? I, I read I, I your, heard, I don't know what that means. I heard really through the yes. open space. And yeah, well, well, let me just share the, what I've heard through the grapevine. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to say my. So we know that the bid has had a meeting with Gail Brewer's office, and one of the many things that came up was public realm issues. Um, and put, you know, some of their ideas that are in draft form are, you know, turning Broadway into a bus and emergency vehicle only way, adding, widening the sidewalks, which would be perfect for open restaurants, adding trees, somehow with congestion pricing, doing the same on Broom Street. I think this is a little Whoa. potentially. Uh, Don't live on Broad yeah, Street. This is in their study. They have, the bid hired a consulting firm, a big consulting firm to do an analysis of the, the uh, analysis of the public realm. And this is their suggestion. So yes. This, this is where that originated. Yes. Um, but because city planning has specifically said they're looking at passive open space options, even though active open space is negatively impacted, and there are more people moving in of the age and their seeker manual would require active and not passive open space, I am concerned that 
there'll be a bench on Broadway or potentially some of these more grandiose plans and that will count as mitigating open space for the 3,300 residents that are projected to move into the neighborhood and the people who already live here. And as far as I can tell, any benches and improvements on Broadway, while possibly lovely, are frankly a benefit to all the retail store owners who sell on that street. And I'm going to repeat something I said last time. If we're going to allow passive open space to be one of the mitigation factors for the new residential buildings, frequently what has happened in Lower Manhattan when an office building is converted into residential use, they put the passive open space on the roof. That's right. Which means the community does not benefit from it. Only those living in the building have the opportunity to the roof deck to use it for whatever passive purpose they need. And no one in the community benefits from what the open space mitigation is. And I think we need to be very cautious about that and say, this is not a solution. It must be on, at street level and it must be open space mitigation that the entire community can be part of, not just the residents. That's fine. And, and this creates a conflict as well because on a couple of the large parcels, right, that where this may be an issue is that the, the response is to have more of a tower design and to have the open space on the ground. I don't know enough about that, but I'm just- Power in the plaza, that's the 19th. But I just, that's, that's the only yeah. way of, of- Tower in the park. On, on large, you know, there's only a couple of large parcels. Yeah, but well, that, that was so one of the so. areas that was identified, the Edison parking lot, big building goes up there and it completely covers the East 4th Street Park and the, the <laughs> Merchant's House Museum in shadows. Yeah. And among other locations, I, I don't have any suggestions other than. But we have to ask for them. We haven't been offered any, have we? Well, it's one of the most important essential parts of living, right? And I think, and I might be stealing Shelby's words, but I think he said something to that effect, and it just stuck out in my mind. And, you know, tied in air and greenery is that? Well, I mean, you're trying to build good housing with good, you know, if it's tied into affordable housing, that you have the proper. Things that come along with it is a responsible Definitely. development, and in you know, in luxury housing of private amenities, those aren't offered for public housing and or it's not, not public, public housing, affordable housing, and 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 I tie that together because that's the 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 amenities as we've seen is there's plenty of press articles about how this is they separate the two sides, etc. There's always some finagling right around that uh, one would think so. Mm. Well, Carter, you've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, well, in the Hudson Square resolution, CB2 did include a number of suggestions for open space mitigation. So it wouldn't be unreasonable for us to mention this as well. So um, I'm also, I, I, I can't really even imagine, you know, and I, I don't, maybe there were drawings about this I didn't see at one of the meetings, but how are we putting benches on Broadway? We're not. We're not. Well, we're not. We're on Broadway, they take away, I mean, look all over the city, look at north of Union Square, yeah. you know, between Pet, bottom of Broadway, between Petco and um, Penn Quotidian. It's what Bloomberg did. You take away a, a lane of traffic and you transform it into those little cafe tables and planters. And, on the street. Um, I mean, there's only one lane of traffic anyway, because exactly. one lane is for buses most yeah. days of the week. So, I mean, I, I and the there are certain areas of Broadway that, like in in the Soho area of Broadway, that are, I mean, you can barely walk down the street on a weekend. Um, at any point, I can't imagine putting obstacles. I could see people actually getting hurt. Um, well, that's why their point of view, I just know this, Akila, because I'm on, I listened to the uh, Public Realm Committee, I'm on that as a, for CB2, for the bid. It was not my and, source. And that, um, <laughs> it's not that you make the sidewalk more crowded, is that they mm -hmm. say that mitigates the crowds by taking away a lane of traffic and giving the people who walk and want to sit another lane. So, right. That's the you know that's why this is I'm not defending it jumps them. Out a whole I'm another not slew of problems. Creative. I mean, one problem solved can create enormous ripple effect on all that traffic yeah. that goes up and down Broadway. So if they put if they like 
did a pedestrian plaza with that count? Like if they like yes, if they, they commandeered it. Howard Street, you know that little spur. I've also heard that, and yeah. Again, it would only be a recommendation. City planning would not be putting it in. Oh, because it would be. A city it would then recommend department. the Department of Transportation put it in, which would then come back to this community. Board. <laughs> and we we see a little bit of this in the Hudson Square bid, right? The create we see this in the Hudson Square bid. They've been pretty active on what. I'm not sure that that means. Well, theirs are a little exactly. different because those are like uh, not the screen. I'm just saying that bushes on the sidewalk kind. Of thing. One, one one of the letters we got said something about, you know, there's nothing in here for trees or any kind of thing to dissipate the heat island. I mean, it's- just, There isn't. Right? <laughs> there isn't. There's no trees. Well, that's yeah. the of our conversation. Yeah, is there, there is nothing. We haven't seen anything. And- <laughs> They're not part of the historic character. I think that's because there's hollow sidewalks and you can't have trees. Exactly. Right. Well, it's not because people don't want trees. They have They have sidewalk vaults. I think we should wrap it up. Okay. Are we done? Um, did you want to say, Donna, I missed you in the beginning as a... No, I mean, I, I love the introduction and I um, I forget what I was going to say. But that was so long ago. <laughs> uh, no, I think that I think right. the is, is, is good. It's come up. Um, okay. So there's, a, there's another part. We don't talk about transfer in there at all. No. Huh? Transferable that. development rights. And and that's just something that really should be. We talked though. about that with Michael yeah, several just, times. And and also the, the financial oh, we were, we were disruptions gonna... of aspects of this plan that's proposed. What are the, the financial disruptions? There's lots, and it's just not addressed by the city. But what a big ask. Can you give me is, one example? With sure. You? You're you're creating development rights that somehow resubsidize a failing building and they suddenly have value that's unrealized and it subsidizes a um uh, a building that's already falling apart if you look at any of the rent bubbles here that's a big issue yeah that's a um the financial disruptions of use group 10 on on uh smaller retail financial disruptions on um just the, the creating so much more luxury housing, you know. I mean, that's is this just another there. reason to be opposed, or is this? It, it's another reason, but it's also somewhere that we asked, and they said, "Oh, we don't need to do. It. Oh, we're not sharing that with you." Okay, but this so it's is another the, no analysis thing that they provide a no analysis. Yeah, but it's also it's it has direct consequences to perpetuating current. We're going to take a vote before it, you all leave. And I think it's an area that we uh, can work on it a little bit more. But we I can't hear you. Highlight some of those um, impacts is undermining, you know, the, the incredible success of this community over the last 50 years. I mean, despite its work changes, and I and I'll just throw in the last bit is that I think we should just include that, you know, that we would are more than interested in, in um, continuing conversation about evolving the community as opposed to rezoning the community. And absolutely, and and I and, I and I want to make a commitment. I think the board should have a commitment continuing this conversation. And we could add that because in there, there for being so many, resolved. That's right, but there are some problems that we don't want to end. This. I are, and that yeah. that that's important. I you think you and too. everybody else got the, all these. So initials. we can put on paper our commitment <laughs> to keep doing this because thank you. Yeah. I don't agree that people are saying delay, stop. We don't want to do it. That's not true no. at all. And, and that's something that we need to be crystal clear about in the resolution. Well, it's the approach. We need to, uh, agree. you know, in, in, in planning and design, if you start, and in anything, I'm sure, if you don't start with the right problem, the right premise, you just have more garbage. It's garbage in or garbage out. You'll never, no matter how much nice, shiny stuff you put on it, it'll always be poor because the, framework was bad, the decisions initially were bad, and that's what we have here. We have a badly, uh, uh, bad start, and they just built on it. Thank you. So before everybody leaves on the yep. committee, I'd like to hear from you. Go ahead. I had, Are we voting to recommend we, denial? Yes. yes. And that's it. We're not we're, the the resolution well, flux. Yeah, I mean, we're, so but we need to know that we're go we're in the right direction, even if we make some modifications based on our conversation. So, so, so this is reject the plan. It's recommended. But, but we're not meeting again. What is rejecting? That is the same thing. thing. Presented to the board. Recommend denial or technically we recommend denial. 
call it reject. That's yes. denial. Denial. I just had a quick question, kind of circling back to our discussion um, about: Is it possible for the, is it possible for the community board of the area in Chinatown that is affected by this to write this or sign on to this? what we're writing together? Is it possible to do like a joint? Well, they haven't had any public hearings um, and we're not specifically opining there would be impacts in that community. I mean, that being said, when um, when there was the rezoning, the, the Essex Crossing, what well, is now Essex Crossing rezoning, the spur rezoning, and there was a side letter agreement to throw in Elizabeth Street Garden, CB2 was never contacted, but we're not actually opining on anything outside of the boundaries of CB2. I right. think that would be a helpful thing to do, but I don't think there's, given this time frame, it's not part of the yeah. formal ULERT process. Or maybe that community board can address in a resolution of some kind the, the lack of engagement and, and, and notification. Yeah. And we can then use that resolution and include that with, with our final. <laughs> I don't think we have time. Or I mean, maybe I, not time for that, but down the road when we go to a hearing. Yeah. Anthony still raising his hand. Anthony, go. But officially, when you were reading out the tear, the, the tear four, yeah. you skip number three and four, officially reading it out loud. I did? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. God. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. You know, so I just want to go back to one of the things that I was going to say. Including <laughs> to just make sure we're including what you brought up the last meeting. If we want to include it. Oh, there's another page. I'm sorry, I didn't turn it over. I hate to I hate it. Uh, materials that have to you need to pull them up. Well, no, 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 no. He's referring to the Chinatown Working Group's uh, affordability recommendations in their report. Uh, I just, I did pass it on to Federica and Anita did see it. I guess. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we review and take out. Then we just take out anything from there that's relevant to the resolution and put it in there. So, so I did insert it into your appendices for a, a resource. In the, oh, it's in the uh, resource. It. It, it's in the resources, but then Frederica did incorporate some language, and then Anita, you, you saw my original email. I did. So you can okay. see if anything in those points oh, you know, fit into the affordability section. Okay. Very good. Yes, yes. We did take some. I, I'm not sure how much. Um, has, has everyone uh, voted who's on the committee as to voting for denial and with some polishing of the resolution, but uh, taking into con uh, taking in our conversations today? And can you send us one final version? That we know I'm in favor. Yeah. In favor? Oh, yes. Any yes. Do vote now? Oh. Federica, Michael. Yes. Mom, oh, I'm not. I'm not a voter. I'm not a. Oh, voter. you're not a voter. <laughs> I'm not a voter. Okay, we're good. <laughs> and and then and then just just to make sure that our decisions are consistent with your what your input, correct, Susan and Akila? You can't vote. Yeah. But we want to make sure that we can know that it's captured your input. Yes, and that's we have that on yeah. the resolution in-person votes and not in-person, which don't officially count, but does inform other board members of people's views. It's actually a really good way to put it. It's not counted, but it's acknowledged in the record. Uh, we are done. You're welcome to stay, keep talking, but I think we should call it a night. It's 10 o'clock, oh, oh, exactly. I am so thirsty. So it's just, it's oh, so I wish I could give you my drink. Good night. I can't share anything. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you, guys. Looking forward.